The answer is yes. Okay. Yes, meaning he did compare your sexual skills to those of other women. Yes. Overruled, that answer will stand. Did he ever compare parts of your anatomy to those of other women? Overruled, you mean answer yes or no? Yes, he does on the 16th. Now, you brought up the sex tape. That's a reference to the phone call you, uh, you recorded at his behest on May 10th, 2008? Yes. Okay. Did you hear that then, Nermi saying at his behest? I heard that. Right, okay. So we are supposed to believe that Travis said to Jody, right, I want you to record this call. And Jody is like, okay. I seriously doubt that. Because if Jody is a Mormon and she took her faith seriously, like she's trying to convince this jury, there is no way she'd want to record that call because she would have as much to lose as Travis. Exactly. And I don't even think that Travis knew he was being recorded. He didn't. He didn't. This was all in case he met someone, um, he got into a relationship with someone, started dating someone seriously. She was going to send this to them, I think. Probably, yeah. 100%, I think that. <laughs> Hello, YouTube and Odyssey. Hi, everybody. Welcome to yet another milestone in our Jodie series, part 30 of our Wicked Witch of the Weird series. Yeah, I hope you all enjoy this. Yeah, this is day 26 of the trial. Um, it's the defence redirect, so Nermi is back up. Um, <laughs> not quite sure what to expect on this one, except that um, it's probably going to be quite a bit slower in terms of pace than Martinez. Yeah, I hope you can all stay awake for it. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, yeah, so we've got that coming up. Just our usual disclaimers. Uh, we're watching this for the very first time. Uh, we watch each day of the trial for the very first time. We never pre-watch anything. Anything we say is either speculation or our opinions. Uh, if we state something as a, fa as a fact and it isn't, we will always hold our hands up and we will be interrupting this with our commentary. So if you'd like to watch the original video without us bussing in and putting our two penneths in and memes, uh, we have put the a link to the original video on David Lewis' playlist in the description. And also, we're not professionals. We don't say we are. We don't have any special training in any body language or anything. We're just two ordinary people who just call what we see. Yeah, we're just two people in the street that you would pass without a second thought um, and not dream that they have a YouTube channel that is dedicated to pouring salt all over a notorious murderer yeah. so that's all we are and we don't claim to be anything better okay should we do this let's get into it let's go please be seated the record will show the presence of the jury the defendant and all counsel mr nermy you may conduct redirect you may good morning Before we start, we've just stopped it here for us just to look at those four amazing people there. Yeah, it looks like the whole fa all the kids are here. Yeah. Um, how brave they must be to, you know, weather this every day, come in every day and listen to her tell lies about their brother. Yeah, but they'll know justice will prevail. Yeah, eventually it will. Last week, when you spoke to Mr. Martinez, you were asked several questions about taking personal responsibility and how you blamed everyone else. Do you remember that line of questioning at various points last week? Yes. In that regard, let me ask you a couple questions. Were you forced to testify? No. 
Now that is just a ridiculous question, isn't it? <laughs> that is bloody stupid. She wanted to bleed and testify. I mean, come on, it became the Jody show. Exactly. When you chose to testify, did you do so with the idea that the lies you told would be called into question? Yes. And you chose to testify anyway. My fucking hero. Approach. Well, you may continue. Now, Miss Arias, getting back to my question, knowing that you were going to, you knew that you were going to be questioned about the lies you told, or you assumed you'd be questioned about the lies you had told throughout this process when you chose to testify, right? Yes. And. You chose to do it anyway. You chose to testify anyway, right? Yes. Okay. And in terms of admitting certain things against this claim that you didn't take any personal responsibility, I recall days ago, one of the first questions I asked you was whether or not you killed Travis Alexander on June 4, 2008. Do you recall that? Yes. And you recall your answer to that question? Yes. Yes. And your answer was that you did, in fact, kill Travis Alexander on June 4, 2008. Do you recall that? Saying, telling us that? Yes. Objection. Um, mistakes what she said. She killed him, but then she added the butt portion. Mistake. Damn, that boy's got a good memory, hasn't he? He's got a great memory. You also told us why you were forced to do that, didn't you? Yes. And remind us, why was that? Well, he was trying to kill me, so I was defending myself. Bullshit. Did you go to Mr. Alexander's home on June 4th with the intent on killing him. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Did at any point in time during that day, June 4th, 2008, did you make a conscious decision that I want to kill Travis Alexander? No, that was never a thought. Oh, yes, it was. Okay. Miss Arias, when you began, talking to counsel for the state. You were shown a couple exhibits and I want to cover those with you. Actually, let me first show you if I can refresh your memory as to when these photographs occurred, showing you exhibits 452 and 453. Yes. And do you remember the date that those that photograph took place? May 15th, 2008. I'm sorry, just say May 15th? Yes, 15th. Okay. Showing you what's been marked <coughs> as Exhibit 452. If I recall correctly, that's you and your sister Angela, right? Yes. All right. And that is your hand around her, right? That's right. Okay. And in Exhibit 453, that's your hand again, right? Yes. Now, before we may, perhaps before we move on past this photograph, you would concede that there's no visible band in your finger, at least in terms of any injury, correct? Correct. Because it hadn't been injured by then. No, it hadn't. Well, it's sort of bent. Right. Well, going back to 452, it appears, I know she's 
Angela is wearing a hat, but it appears that she's a few, at least a few inches shorter than you. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's her height. Okay. How tall are you, Miss Arias? I think I'm five, five and a half or five, six, somewhere around there. I'm a little taller than that, so I'm going to ask Miss Wilmot to come forward. Jody, if you could um, step down, please, in front of the jury. Judge, uh, for the purposes of this, we need to have Ms. Wilmot's height uh, in whatever it is that she's wearing. Other than that, I would object on the grounds of relevance. Any relevant objections are ruled. And we'll just have Ms. Wilmot, for the record, state uh, her height. I would say I'm 5'3", five, 5'4", five, with heels on. I can't be certain. I don't know how high my heels are. Okay. If you could, Jody uh, and Ms. Wilmot, could we see you, for lack of a better term, recreate the pose we see in Exhibit 452? if you could turn. Okay, thank you. Now, prior to, well, we talked a lot about injuries. You sustained your hands. And when you have sustained those injuries, prior to June 4th, immediately prior, I should ask, did you have any suffer any injuries to either one of your hands? Yes. Could you tell us how those injuries occurred? Um, I believe it was my index finger and I was putting away um, big margarita glasses at work. The state. When were you putting away these margarita glasses? I believe, if I remember correctly, it was June 1st. That's what the date stamp said on the photo. I don't care where you work. I don't care what industry you work in. If you have an accident when you were at work, you fill in the accident book. Yeah, and if it is a bit serious, you go to the hospital. Yeah. Now, if she cut her index finger as badly as she said, there will be a record of it in the accident book at Casa Ramos or wherever she was working, right? If she cannot produce that accident book to verify her claim that she had injured her finger on the 1st of June, it's bollocks. It's Just a, more lies. Yeah, it's as simple as that, isn't it? Yep. Okay. And what happened to your hand on, and where were you working? Uh, Casa Ramos. Okay. And how did you injure yourself putting away margarita glasses at Casa Ramos? Um, I was just moving too fast and I was being, I was a little bit clumsy, not intentionally, but I just, um, there's a metal shelf beneath the bar and that's where they all sit and cool off because when they come out of the dishwasher, they're really hot. Um, so they have to cool off before we can put margaritas in them or they'll crack. So I was rotating the cool ones from the back out and putting the hot ones in the back. And as I was reaching in with my hand, um, I hit some of the metal and it, it peeled back some of the skin. And it was just um, a wound. Blah, 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 word salad, blah, 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 bollocks, blah, 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 bullshit, blah, 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 marshmallows, blah, 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 raisins. Blah, 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 blah. For crying out loud, it feels like we've gone back in time, doesn't it? 
<laughs> we always go back in time when it's the it, when it's her and him. I mean, you know, not only have we got back to her just blah, 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 blah like that, you know, just talking utter crap. We've now got to go back to, you know, having questions delivered at a snail's pace. I mean, you know, that's one thing I miss about Martinez is his questions came up, you know, rapid rates. But with Nermi, with all due respect to the guy, it's like bloody stodging through treacle, isn't it? I'll just get with the programme, man. Move on. If any of you ever seen One Foot in the Grave, the show One Foot in the Grave, and you ever watched the opening sequence, that's Nermi's style of questioning. Yeah. They say I might as well face the truth. Did you photograph those injuries? Yes. And how did you do that? Um, just with my phone. Okay. Um, would that be the heliophone we'd been discussing earlier? Yes. If I may approach, Your Honor. Yes. Sir, I just want to show you what's been marked as exhibits 506 and 507, uh, respectively. Could you take a look at both those exhibits and see if you recognize those as the photographs you took? Yes. I guess the date would have been the 31st of May instead. Okay. I'm going to move to admit exhibits 506 and 507. Objection relevance, issue injuries to the right hand. May we approach? May approach. Objection overruled, exhibits 506 and 507 are admitted. And Jody, why the, before, while those are being marked into evidence, could you uh, describe for us why you chose to take these photographs? Yes, um, after my boss gave me a big band-aid to cover it, because it was, it kind of covered a larger surface area, and so I went home, took a shower, and then after that I peeled it back just to check on it, and it was just kind of gnarly, so it was like a trophy picture kind of, I was going to send it to some friends, say, look what I did at work. I mean, it sounds strange saying it post June 4th, but before that it wasn't it didn't seem like a big deal. I just, I sent it to a few friends to say, look what happened, this is crazy, kind of thing. Okay. Showing you what's been marked as exhibit 506. That's one of the cuts you sustained to your hand? Yeah, the fold of the skin is back over the injury. And can you tell from this exhibit, is this your right or left hand? That would be my right hand. And exhibit 507, um, is that a photograph of a different injury or the same injury? The same one, different angle. Okay. And we're talking about your right index finger as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, Ms. Arias, you had told us that these injuries occurred on the 31st of May, is that? It would accurate? have been the 31st or the 1st. I'm not sure if the time stamp on that is also Greenwich time or if it's Pacific Standard Time. Okay. Oi. Grammar Nazi Marshmallow Garden Cow. It's Greenwich, not Greenwich. Get it right. But given that you were serving margaritas, uh, would it be safe to assume you weren't working the breakfast shift? That's correct. Okay. So it would have either been the evening of the 31st or the evening of the 1st when these injuries occurred. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. Okay. And these injuries we just saw in uh, exhibits 506 and 507, uh, had they healed by the time uh, you went to Utah on June 5th or 6th? I think, I think it had healed mostly. 
Do you recall if you still had bandages on your hand? Um, I don't actually recall. I know I eventually got bandages on my hand, but I don't remember if I still had one from the index finger or not, or if, I don't remember. Okay. So these photos were taken with her Helio phone either on the 31st of May or the 1st of June, so like three, four days before she murdered Travis, yeah? Yeah, apparently. Right. I don't know whether the metadata confirms that. I'm presuming it, it will because the defense wouldn't dare to introduce evidence saying that, you know, this this picture was taken at, on such a day and they found out later that it wasn't. I don't think they dare do that. Right? They no, I don't it. think they would. Okay. So if these photos were taken on that, those one of those two days, right, and it was prior to killing Travis, do you think they could be faked? It's easy to fake photos these days you, and it was back then as well yeah do you think she did this with foresight that she could very well have injured herself while stabbing him knowing what she was going to do or stabbing mimi if she was there do you think that this was foresight for her as kind of to give herself a bit of an alibi well considering what she is like considering what i've heard in this trial i would not put it past her to fake those photos no me neither i mean we've probably got you know our viewers now screaming at the screen you know saying that this isn't the case but this is our first time through if you know we have got any of this wrong please do you know let us know otherwise in the in the comments and we will hold our hands up yeah now before we get too far off the subject of hand injuries uh, in Utah, you said that you weren't sure if you had bandages on those, you know, these injuries on your right hand. Do you recall if you had any other injuries uh, to your hand? In Utah? In Utah. I did. I had band-aids on my right hand, and I don't think it was the index finger. I think they were other fingers. I don't remember. But I know I had band-aids on my right hand. Now, the band-aids on your right hand, you said it may not have been your index finger. Was this, these, were these injuries caused by the same incident uh, at Casa Ramos, or were they caused by something else? Uh, something else. Okay, and what was that? It was broken glass. I dropped one of Travis's glasses when I was downstairs. When I arrived the morning of June 4th, we, we were getting water from, he has a cold water dispenser on his fridge, so... I was getting water and I dropped one and I was cleaning up the glass because I thought, I mean, I clean up glass at work and it's not something I'm uncomfortable with. So I guess I was being too casual and careless and I cut my hands, my fingers. Okay, so first, she cuts her fingers at work when she drops a glass. Yeah. Then she drops a glass at Travis's, supposedly. Yeah. Cuts her finger and then she drops his camera. Yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it, whether she's actually got flesh on her hands or whether it's just made up of butter or grease. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the amount of things she's dropped, she's dropped a major bollock with this testimony as well, hasn't she? Oh, absolutely. And you have stated to us that those injuries were on your right hand. That's correct. How are you so confident of that? That's what I remember pretty clearly. Okay. As it relates to your left hand, do you recall having injuries on your left hand when you were in Utah? I don't recall one way or another. I definitely don't remember an injury. Um, I'm not saying there wasn't, but I don't remember one. Would it be fair to say that whatever injuries you had on your hand when you arrived in Utah weren't your primary focus? That would be fair to say. Now we heard about some of the, the injuries to your hand we heard about the struggle or fight you had with Mr. Alexander on June 4th. 
Did you have any other injuries visible when you went to Utah? As far as visible, not that I'm aware of. I had other injuries, but I don't, I think they were covered with clothing. Are you telling us then that you had to make effort to make sure these injuries were covered? No, I think it was just like I had injuries around on my feet and my ankles. And I think just because I was wearing socks and shoes, they weren't visible. I sincerely hope she changed her socks after that. <laughs> yeah, but the only time will tell. I'm guessing she didn't, dirty bitch. <laughs> well, she is, so she wouldn't, would she? Now this injury again, maybe you could be so kind as to, to hold up and show us your broken finger again as you did on direct. Oh. Your finger? Regular. No, this way. This oh. way, so it's visible. Like this? Okay. When did that injury occur? Uh, January 22nd, 2008. Okay. You're lying, you're a sexually unsatisfied woman living in a dream world. Now you were asked, and that is the injury you incurred when you testified to having received when Mr. Alexander was kicking you in the ribs and he ended up kicking your hand, correct? That's correct. Okay. You were asked about any medical attention uh, that you might have sought uh, for that. And you said something to the effect of you didn't seek any professional medical attention. Do you recall that? Yes. Which is the first thing you would do if you had an injury. Well, yeah, because you'd like to know if it's more serious than you think or if she's got if there's any internal bleeding. Yeah. I mean, you know, she cut her hand or she cut her finger. If that was deep, it could get infected. So, you know, a normal person, a non-narcissistic psychopath swamp donkey marshmallow garden dweller would go to the hospital or at least go and see a doctor. Not her. How convenient. Did you receive anything that could be considered quote unquote medical attention? Did you bandage it? Could you just kind of explain that to us? Yes, um, we didn't bandage it because there was no broken skin. But um, after Travis calmed down and apologized, he was he made a splint for it, and I just thought that was really nice because he got really angry and then was very ashamed. Actually, on the scope of the question: What medical treatment? <laughs> How did you how did you feel about uh, Travis making this? You said Travis made this splint for you. Um, how did you feel about him making that? Objection being on scope. your feelings by the state. Approach, please. And Miss Arias, <clears throat> you would just were telling us. Mr. Alexander broke your finger, that you didn't receive any professional medical treatment for it, but that Mr. Alexander made a splint for you. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, a splint made by Travis would not make her broken finger better. It is a temporary measure. Yeah, it's only until she could get to a hospital and get professional treatment for it. Yeah, she knows this. She doesn't think the jury knows this. She's so full of crap. The jury see right through her. Yeah. And how did you feel about him making that for you? Um, it sounds kind of weird, but it was kind of endearing because he was very tender with it. He was very, he was being very careful and he got a bag of ice and crushed it and we put ice on it. And so he just, did what he could to write what he had wronged, I guess you could say. So that meant a lot. And you found that, and that was enough to, for you to perceive it as endearing, is that right? Yes, the moment was endearing. It seemed very tender. He's, he was very sincere. And I mean, I, when I got home, I took it off and cried. And he made another one for me. 
Can you believe what she's saying at the moment? I mean, how can you find someone who breaks your finger endearing? Yeah, especially like a few minutes after they've done it. You'd be out of the door. You'd say you you effing psychopath or whatever you'd be straight on the road to the hospital calling the police on on the way and you'd be angry and upset you would not be like oh you broke my finger oh but you're cute that's just <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry that's just ridiculous she just contradicted herself yeah completely later but at the moment when he made it he was just very gentle with it mm. During the time you spent answering Mr. Martinez's questions, you know, you're talking about how great it was for him to make this splint for you. We also saw some journal entries and text messages and things that talked about were in, in which you praised Travis. Um, do you remember seeing those throughout the yes. course of the, okay. I want to ask you about a few of those in areas. We were talking about some of the things you had told us during cross-examination, some of the things you've been shown about how great a guy you thought Travis was. I want to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 484. You see that? Yes. You said, Travis, I thank you for being such an amazing friend. Was he an amazing friend to you? Yes, at times he was very amazing. You say at times. Well, we heard about uh, the Cinnabon card that he left on your car when you came home from a trip. Yes. Address unknown. Were there, let's, before maybe we go beyond that, what made him such an amazing friend to you? It's more about how he made me feel. He would, um, and things he would say. He believed in me. He saw my potential or saw potential in me. And he just made me feel like I could go I don't know, he made me feel really good, like I could realize that potential and beyond. And I feel like he saw past whatever exterior was there and saw inside, and he made me feel like I was a beautiful person inside. Okay, you said a couple things there. You said you made, he made you feel as if you could realize your potential. Is that something that anyone else, any, is that feeling something that anyone else had given you in your life? Occasionally. Um, Daryl and occasionally Matt and I don't really remember with Bobby, but. Oh, greetings, it is I, the Count. I mean, I think I had, there was a few art teachers that really believed in me. I don't know. But was there something different, be it the frequency or the type of affirmation about your potential that Mr. Alexander was giving you that was different than the affirmations you might have been getting from other people in your, in your history? I would say it was different. Um, it was a lot more intense, uh, more frequent. It's kind of like I was swept off my feet. Um, he came at me really strong, but in a positive way, and it was it wasn't like what I experienced had experienced before. It was nothing like what I experienced before, but it was similar in that it was positive, but it was just like amplified. That would be a good description. Okay. 
He raised me up to walk on stormy seas. So do you, you, you tell him that uh, you call him a rock, a light, and an inspiration. Was that When you said that on April 18, 2008, was that sincere, your sincere feeling? Yes. What did you mean by inspiration? Did he, how did he inspire you? Um, he was a motivational speaker and he would give um, talks sometimes at, at um, prepaid legal events. And he, would, he wouldn't just inspire me, he would inspire the whole crowd. So it created a, a sort of synergy or an energy in the room that just makes you feel like you can walk out of the room and conquer the world. He had a gift for that. And those, that inspiration you talk about him providing in, in motivational speaking uh, at prepaid legal seminars, did he provide that to you on a personal basis? Yes, he counseled me many times on a lot of subjects. Okay. You talk about how you appreciate the ways he's gone out of the way for you. What do you mean by that? Um, do you want examples, you mean? Yeah, if you could give us an example. Well... I don't know about you, but that whole exchange there sounded completely contrived, didn't it? Yeah, it was totally planned. Yeah, yeah. Yo, oh, yeah, give me some examples, yeah. Bad actor. Very bad actor. Both of them, aren't they? Yeah, they're not going to get anything for it. <laughs> no Oscars, no Golden Globes, not even a bloody Razzie. Well, when he, he, when he got me to move to Arizona, he put up, he paid for the um, rental. Um, so I put all of my things from Palm Desert, well, I had from Big Sur, and then I went to Palm Desert to get more things. And um, he paid for the rental to get out there, and I paid him back, but he gave me the money for it. And then um, he offered to have me store all of my things, my extra things that I didn't have room for at the house I was renting. He offered to let me store them at his house. Um, like my paintings, he cleared a space in his office closet just for them so that they wouldn't be exposed to the elements. Everything else went in the garage. Um, my house plants, I didn't have room for them where I was, so he made space on his kitchen counter to keep them there. They stayed there for the whole time. I lived in Mesa. Um, other times when we were maybe at a prepaid legal event, um, locally, he would pick up the tab if it was just dinner or something. Um, just little nice gestures that he would do. There was the Cinnabon thing that he went out of his way to, just to go get that just for me because he knew I wouldn't be able to get it when I flew back into Sky Harbor. Um, I mean, there are tons of little things like that that he would do constantly. Okay. More reasons to keep him alive than kill him. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now, drawing your attention back to April 18th and that time period of 2008, uh, one of the things you were asked about by Mr. Martinez is your, is your feelings towards Mr. Alexander. So, in that, re in, in that regard, drawing your attention to this time period, did you love Mr. Alexander? Yes. Now, when you were talking about, when you were asked about that last week, uh, you kind of were saying that it was, you loved him, but it was different than it had been uh, in the past. And you weren't allowed to explain that. So if you could kind of explain that difference, uh, how you felt about him previously, as to how you felt about him, say, using April 18th. 2008 is the guide post. Objection to the characterization. Characterization, not allowed to explain it. Sustained. Rephrase your question. You explained to us the difference between how you felt about Mr. Alexander when you were dating him and you were involved in a relationship as to post to April 18, 2008? Um, yes. When we first... I began... I felt like I began to love him early on, but not in love. Like, I... Basically, I, I love all people, so he obviously he got that advancement automatically. 
But then as I got to know him, my love for him grew. And I wasn't sure we were going because for about five months after meeting, we sort of just meandered without being in any kind of official relationship. But soon I began to fall in love with him. And that was during the time we were dating. And I felt pretty intense as far as being in love with him. And so when I discovered the things he was doing outside of our relationship, obviously that hurt and we broke up. But I still loved him. The love didn't go away just because the trust did. So he, we were sort of making an effort to maybe get back together or not, testing the water. And then I kind of realized that maybe that wasn't he wasn't going to change. And then when he, the day, the morning have a pie when he, when he swore at me, I just thought, mm, you know, I didn't like I said I didn't want to continue with somebody like that that could speak to like I didn't want to have children with somebody that could speak to their mother that way I kind of looked at it that way so I still loved him but I began to pull back from the idea of a future with him and so we remained in a limbo state for a while and then it became apparent around Christmas time of 2007 is when I flew back home and realized I want to be here I don't want to be in Arizona anymore so right so we've let her run her mouth there haven't we and let her just talk about whatever crap she wants to pull out of that garden haven't we yeah so here's what we think happened we don't know for sure nobody will know for sure but um they met the first night and that's when she fell in love with him yeah but i don't think it was love it's more obsessed yeah str strong infatuation but kind of yes this is a guy i could really get into they go on that trip she reveals her true self to him he thinks wow there's no way i want a future with her she's, but she's not for me yeah but being in a relationship is kind of like eating the same meal every day if you want to look at it that way with Jody, it's like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet. So while he didn't want her to be the same meal that he ate every day, he was quite happy for her to be his buffet, if you like, that he could pick whatever he wanted from. Yeah, because she was into it too. Yeah. He found, he was he couldn't resist her um, in terms of physical. I mean, she pushed his buttons that way. And that turned out to be fatal for him. But And she knew that and she capitalised on that. Of course she did, but that's the kind of person that she is. Yeah. It's just such a shame that she manipulated him and now she's trying to make it look as if he is the aggressive, violent one, the, the one that created all the drama and it was really her. And it's so frustrating to watch, isn't it? It's very, very frustrating. Yeah, so those of you who are veterans of the trial and who have to sit through this, we feel your pain. Yeah, sorry. Well, um, let me ask you this, and maybe this would be an over, oversimplification, but forgive me if, if, if I do so. Would this early on period be more of a romantic love in the time, April 18, 2008, would that be more of a platonic love? for lack of a better way of saying it? It's, it's complicated because I felt, by that time, I felt more in an unconditional love where I just, in terms that I just wanted him to be happy, I wanted him to have a future that was happy. I wanted to have my own future, but I wanted us to be able to remain on good terms. And at the same time, we kept confusing our boundaries because we were still sleeping together and doing that. So that kind of kept me, my heart more involved than maybe it should have been. Okay. So on April 18th, 2008, then, what you're telling us is you, you're, you had an unconditional love for him. That's how I would characterize it. Okay. She calls it unconditional love. We call it obsession. Exhibit 485, if I'm correct, was the uh, note you made uh, at his memorial, correct? Yes. Just 
No, you can't see it all here. Let me bring it up for you. That was your note to him, correct? Correct. And you had through email or what have you at least provided that photo uh, of him to someone who was organizing that service. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Before we get into the content of this, uh, would it be safe to assume you weren't the only person at this memorial service? Yes. Matter of fact, you told us you talked to several people at that memorial service, correct? Yes, I knew a lot of people there. You weren't the only person, to your understanding, that thought Travis was a great guy, were you? No, I was not. A few moments later. As to what you wrote. And do you remember when his memorial service was? I believe it, it was on a Sunday or maybe a Monday. So it would have been the 15th or 16th of June. Okay. So on the 15th or 16th of June, you write that, Travis, you're beautiful on the inside and out. Did you mean that? Yes. And you also say you always told me that. Did Travis tell you that you were beautiful on the inside and out as well? Is that what you're saying there? Yeah, he said I was more beautiful on the inside. And that made you feel good about yourself? Yes. Well, if he did tell her that, then he must have been blowing smoke up her ass. You tell him that you never stop believing in him. And I know that you always believed in me. When you say you never stopped believing in Travis, what were you referring to? Um, his potential and his ability to realize what he wanted to do with his life. And I also believed that he could get better and fix the parts of him that he considered broken or that needed work like we all have those parts and he was constantly striving to work on himself hello what planet are you living on planet zog do you need mental help do you need to go and see the doctor you say thank you for sharing so much and is it fair to me to assume that you're talking about more than storage space for your pictures? Yes. What do you mean by that? I just mean the things that he imparted to me. He shared a lot spiritually with me and his wisdom, his insights, his philosophies, his creeds, all of these things that I, I sort of adopted a lot of them and we went on so many trips. We It felt like we had lived an entire lifetime in one year and so I was basically referring to the whole canon of experiences that we'd had. Well as we all know as soon as she went to prison she dropped the spirituality and faith pretense. She no longer believes in any of that. I don't even think she ever did. Well her excuse for that was because the Mormons people only came round to the prison twice a year. Yeah, but even if that was the case, your faith would still be strong. Let's face it, there's only two reasons she joined the Mormon church. One for Travis, and two because she knew she would get regular helpings of chocolate, starfish, a la sausage. That's a bloody Lutler. And his sharing of his, I think you said philosophical and spiritual self and beliefs and feelings, that meant a lot to you? 
Yes, very much. You also say that the world has been blessed because he, you, referring to Travis, have been here. When you wrote that on June 15th or June 16th of 2008, did you believe that? I did. Could somebody please explain to me a question that we may have asked you before, but we'll ask it once again. How could somebody who allegedly was a child abuser be a blessing to the world? I don't know. I hope someone could answer that. Yeah, me too. You finish this note to him by saying I love you. On June 15th or 16th of 2008, did you still feel that same unconditional love, to use your words, for Travis that you were feeling in April of 2008? Well, I still had love for him, yes, and... Fuck off. I was thinking now more in terms of eternity. Well... That makes sense, given the time frame where we're at. But let's maybe take a step back from eternity for a second. Looking at that quote, I love you. Would that be a true statement on June 2nd, 2008? Yes. No. June 3rd? Yes. 2008? June 4th, 2008. Yes. Nope. Sorry. How about the days in between June 4th, 2008 and his memorial service? Would that be true? Yes. Bullshit! How about today? Yes. Would that be true? Yes, yeah? it's still true. Go and kiss your mother's behind. You also talked about uh, you, you said something. You, you, you recall hearing the uh, recorded phone call you had with Mr. Alexander on May 10th, 2008. Recall hearing that? Yes, I do. Trial? Okay. Yeah, and she's not the only bugger, is she? No, everyone has to sit there and bloody listen to it. Yeah, it's seared into our memory. I'll tell you, when I joss it and my life flashes before my eyes, that flash is going to last about 12 hours because most of it's going to be this bloody sex tape. Yeah, just the bloody noises. Yeah, that'll be enough to send me to hell. And something was said on there. Because, you know, apart from the spiritual side of your relationship and the friendship, the close friendship you shared, there was a sexual aspect to your relationship as well, right? Yes. And part of that, anyway, we've seen in the in the phone call of May 10th right yes you made a comment uh, in that tape uh, about him making you feel like a goddess I believe those were your words do you remember that yes okay even Travers was smart enough to know you can't polish a turd Refresh our memory, first of all, when what he was doing to make you feel like a goddess, or what that was a reference to. It was a reference to the time that we took a bath together when he had all the candles everywhere and rose petals and there was music. And it wasn't just, it didn't go 
quickly. It was it was drawn out. It was romantic. And that made you feel great, right? Yes. Do you know? I think she's telling the truth there, but yeah. I, I I do think that she's talking about pretty early on in their relationship when he still viewed her as possible marriage material and he was trying to woo her. Yeah. Other than that, after she's shown her him is her true colours then yeah you... it'd just be a futile exercise for him really wouldn't it yeah pretty but, much yeah but i think she's telling the truth about this but i think she's embellishing the time it happened of course she is she's lying about that well she's lied about most things hasn't she <laughs> well she has were there other times in your relationship your sexual relationship where it could be said you felt like a goddess. Were there other times? Mm -hmm. Yes. Describe those for us. Well, they were, it was more just how, rather than the act, it almost could have been almost any act, but it was how he made me feel and how his demeanor was and how he treated me during those things that made me feel special. And like, it wasn't just for physical gratification, it was because our minds and our hearts were sort of in alignment as well. I'm sorry, but how many bloody Michael Bolton songs has she been listening to? Is that a feeling that you experienced before in your life, before Mr. Alexander? I would say yes, I've experienced it before. Probably when she was kicking Doggy Boy. To this degree? Well, as far as the way he put me on a pedestal, no. Not to that degree. And you say he put you on a pedestal. We talked about it, we talked a little bit this morning about, you know, the, the bath the, you know, the, the things he did for you. Were there other things you felt like we haven't talked about where he put you on this, this pedestal? Um, it was more like the way he would look at me sometimes, compliments he would give me, and sometimes just out of the blue he would recall something that I did um, or a thought he had that day, and it was... Usually it was in terms of elevating me above all else kind of thing. And I mean, I didn't really believe it, but I believed that he might believe it. So it kind of, it made me feel special because he viewed me that way, that I was somebody special. I can see what they're trying to do here. And this is very carefully concocted because Nermi, Wilmot, Maria De La Rosa and Jodi Arias all know that the past five days of testimony have done huge damage to their case. Yeah, and now they're trying to repair the damage, but yes. they can't. They're trying to tell the world just what a beautiful, virtuous um, woman this is and how she doesn't deserve to go to prison for the rest of her life for being so maniacal in murdering her boyfriend. They're trying to, um, as we said earlier, polish a turd and you cannot do that can you no once it's out you can't go back yeah so in terms of your relationship with mr alexander then there were times when you were way up here on this pedestal right yes and there were other times you were down on the ground being kicked right yes okay. you were right way up here on this pedestal right yes you were also down on the ground is that correct Yes. Were you kicked? Yes, me. Were you kicked while you were on the ground? Once I was, yes. On one occasion, I mean, he kicked me twice. Yes, question before Okay. So we have a relationship with lots of highs. And lots of lows, right? Yes. Now, you testified previously that you met Travis 
in September 2006. You talked about your relationship. You were in a relationship with Mr. Brewer. You talked to us eventually about the time that you became a couple with Mr. Alexander and times when you weren't a couple with Mr. Alexander. Do you recall doing that? Yes. Okay. What I want to talk about now is because it may not be clear, and, and you were asked about, do you recall being asked about after breaking up why you felt like you had permission to be over at his home, that sort of thing. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And in that regard, what was the difference first starting say for example with the interaction between you and Mr. Alexander excuse me of when you were a couple by the definitions that you and, and he had used uh, as opposed to when you weren't a couple by that same definition was there a difference in terms of how you interacted with each other As far as, um, well, I, in my mind, I drew a distinction. We still continued to um, be intimate and hang out and go on dates and travel and talk late at night and email and chat and text back and forth. All those things continued, but I drew a distinction in my mind that he's no longer my boyfriend. I'm no longer his girlfriend. We're just maybe going to get back together or maybe not. It was kind of like that. We were in a state of limbo for a while. Their relationship, when they were officially dating, to use her words, lasted, what, five months, something like that? Yeah, five or six, something like that. Right, okay. After five or six months, even though Travis was quite eager to get into a relationship where he could marry, I very much doubt that he was treating Jodie as a spouse. And mm, no. And giving her free access to his home, you know, to come and, and go when she pleased. Certainly not then, and definitely not after... They break up. I mean, you know, if she showed her true colours, then he's not going to want her coming in and out of his house. Especially unexpected. Yeah. And let's face it, she came and went as she pleased. She, If she couldn't get in, she crawled in through the doggy door, which is completely appropriate for her. <laughs> um, and she invaded his privacy and his space. She peeked in his windows. She let herself in whenever she wanted to. No one in their right mind would just let someone come in whenever they felt like it. I don't care how long you've known them. No, they wouldn't. And she's trying, her and Nermi are trying to portray this as normal behaviour. It's anything but. I would challenge anybody, sorry, that was my phone. I would challenge anybody who has this sort of relationship and who watches us to come forward and say so, because this is completely not normal, is it? It isn't. It's more like obsessive yeah well let's let's break that down a little bit if we could you were having a sexual relationship with mr. Alexander before you became a couple correct yes and that sexual relationship that included oral sex yes did it include anal sex before you were a couple? Just the one time the night I was baptized and that ended pretty quickly. Okay. And did it include, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, vaginal sex? No. Okay. Quite a few people in our comments have made the point that Nermi seems to be somewhat obsessed with the sexual details of this. Uh, we've had quite a few people say that, and to be to be honest with you, we can understand why, can't we? Yeah, because all he's doing, he keeps going over and over this sex tape. Yeah, and about whether they had anal, anal sex, oral, oral sex. He hasn't mentioned penile vaginal intercourse yet. He's mentioned vaginal, so he's ha like halfway there. He'll, he'll mention it bloody soon. He will, yeah, but I think kind of 
reading between the lines, what he's trying to do is kind of capture any positives that he can find about Jodie, right? And their sex life, whether it is anal, oral, pop rocks, whatever, right? If they both enjoyed it, that is a positive. And it's, it was a healthy aspect of their relationship, even if anything, everything else wasn't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They enjoyed an active sex life. Um, just all the other stuff that they couldn't make work, and it was more or less down to her and her obsessive personality, really, wasn't it? Well, it was basically her antics and her behaviour. Yeah. Um, Christina, the crackpot Christmas tree. Yeah. So when you became a couple, then... Did the sexual relationship, did that somehow automatically change the sexual boundaries between the two of you? No, it didn't really change. We kept the, tried to keep the same standards, I guess you could say. Me, the, the, the standards being uh, the law of chastity as told to you by Mr. Alexander, is that right? Thank you. Are we talking about the laws of chastity as told to you by Mr. Alexander? Yes. And that standard, to your understanding, what did that prohibit? What act did that prohibit? It prohibited um, premarital vaginal sex. Honestly, cannot remember if we've raised this point before. As I say, it's been a long series, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, if you know, Mormon chastity may have prevented them from engaging in vaginal sex. It may not have prevented them, strictly speaking, from engaging in anal sex, oral sex, whatever, anything other than vaginal sex. But I'm sure if they confessed... That if they were having anal or oral sex or pop rocks, whatever, to a bishop, then it would be considered a sin and they would have to repent. Yeah, they would. So, but I don't think either one of them were ready to confess. Oh, God, no. No. It would. I think they were each other's dirty little secret. I don't think it just applies to Jody. No, it does apply to uh, Travis. Travis as well, to that extent, even though we know she wasn't 100% fully on board with the Mormon church. Yeah, it was only because of Travis. At least she kept up the pretense and the appearance that she was on board with it and was prepared to go along with some of the rules and regulations, so to speak. Yeah. And you had told us about the incident uh, where you were sleeping and you woke up with Mr. Alexander's penis inside your vagina. Do you remember telling us about that? Yes. I want to wake up with you. Was he your boyfriend at that time? Yes. So... You didn't have vaginal intercourse until you were boyfriend and girlfriend, correct? That would have been the first time, so. Yeah, but it wasn't regular. It was, I guess I kind of looked at it as an accident or a mistake, and we didn't do that again until after we broke up. You say that you saw this first encounter where he was inside your vagina with his penis as an accident or mistake. Is that right? Yes. That's what you're describing? Okay. Hang on. Am, am I here? Is this reality? <laughs> because, I mean, come on. Over the last 19 years, we've woken up in spoons, haven't we? Yeah. Not once has my John Thomas been anywhere near your orifices, <laughs> your lower orifices, has it? No, not by mistake or accident. 
I mean, you know, he has he has been stood to attention at times. <laughs> But it hasn't, you know, he hasn't found his way anywhere where he shouldn't have been, you know. So that is, could anybody out there, do you think that is plausible? Because I am having problems wondering if I'm in the pissy matrix or something at the moment after hearing that. She's in the bloody matrix. How is it that you can rationalize or characterize this invasion in that way? Characterization, invasion, character, rationalize. Let me see your question. He places his penis in your vagina when you're asleep, right? Yes. And you just told us you wrote that off to a mistake. That's how I looked at it. Now I could drop a pen and it'd be a mistake, but it'd be hard to do what he did as a mistake. So how do you get there in your mind? Um, well, I don't... We were sleeping and no words were exchanged. He... Like, all of his motor skills were functioning, but I don't know that if he was, if he was really, like, mentally conscious or not. He was there, he was breathing hard, that kind of thing, but he didn't say anything and it was never mentioned the next day, so I assumed maybe... I don't know, maybe he wasn't fully aware of what he was doing because maybe he was groggy or disoriented or still half asleep. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we've mentioned this before, haven't we? But um, there are times when you're with someone and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're feeling horny, aren't you? Yeah. It doesn't usually happen by mistake, though. No. It doesn't usually happen when one of you is asleep either. The other person responds. If the other person isn't responding, then you'd usually go back to sleep, wouldn't you? But usually either the other person will say, not tonight, dear, I've got a headache, or, you know, they'll get cracking and join in. Yeah. Either one of the two things are going to happen. So I very much doubt that he would do that while she's asleep. He wouldn't. It seems out of character for him. It's he Take two to tango. It does, very much so, and she's lying her ass off here. Getting back to the idea of you and Mr. Alexander as a couple and not a couple, the you broke up on what day? June 29, 2007. June, as, as we've heard though, June 29th, 2007 was not the end of your sexual relationship with him, right? That's right. So in that regard, one has to ponder, what does that, what did the end of that relationship mean in terms of your relationship with Travis? It meant to me that we were now two sovereign single adults. You've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. A lot of people, when they break up, and you could, can you understand that a lot of people when they break up, that's that's the end of things. They, they stop sleeping together, they stop contacting each other, right? other people. The state. After you broke up, you said your words sounded more like uh, intergovernmental relations. You said you were both two sovereign states, right? Is that what I heard? Yes, we were single and free to make our own decisions. Okay. Sovereign entities. Single and free to make your own decisions. Yet you were, you then, by your testimony, were still making the decision to engage in sexual relations with Mr. Alexander, correct? Rejection is the answer, 
Overall, do me answer. Yes, I was still making that decision. And you were asked about, well, based on your assessment of this breakup then, was he, to use your words, as a sovereign state, free to engage in sexual activity with whomever he chose, in your mind? In my mind, except for the moral implications, I believe that he was free to do that, and it would be, it should be, it would be something that I shouldn't take offense to because he's not my boyfriend any longer. Well, she's clearly intent on perpetuating the lies, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, that's just... I mean, she did take offence to it because she went off, her, off his head whenever he went out on a date. Yeah, and let's not forget that when Lisa Andrews and him were having an intimate moment, she was peeking through the windows. She was spying on him. Yeah, that's psycho behaviour, that is. That man had no privacy. He was a marked man from the second that he met her. That was his downfall. Yeah. Well, what about other concerns? What about health concerns? Did you feel like he was obligated to let you know if he engaged in sexual behavior with anyone else because of fear of sexually transmitted diseases? That was one concern I had, yes. Did you and he discuss that situation? We're broken up, but we're still going to have sex, but I'm going to let you know if I start with someone else? There was a conversation somewhat like that, so I assumed he would just tell me if he decided to date somebody else. Um, that's why I asked him when I saw him with that girl. But um, it wasn't as far as STDs and that kind of thing. We didn't have a sit down discussion about it. As someone who has been there, I can tell you that there is a huge difference between dating someone and sleeping with someone. That's true. Once you sleep with the person you're dating, you're no longer dating them. You're in a relationship with them. Whether it's a committed relationship or not, you are in a relationship with them. And with relationships come responsibilities, don't they? Exactly. Including STDs and including the risk of getting pregnant. Yeah, they should use protection. Now, I personally think that if anybody was at any risk of any STDs, it would be Travis at risk from her. Because let's face it, a bloody minge is like the Jersey Tunnel, isn't it? Oh well, yeah, it's been seen to so many times. Yeah, and it's been well explored. Oh yeah. Okay. And you, you mentioned the girl. You're talking about when you went to Mr. Alexander's home, you saw him with this girl through the window. Yes. Right? And you were asked, why was it okay for you to be there after you had broken up. Do you recall being asked that? Yes. Why was it okay for you to be there? Well, the night that I went there, it was okay because he gave me the green light. Um, I called him before going. He said, sure. It was a very good yes. Explanation A. Travis gave her the green light to come round. She went round. Um, knocked on the door, rang on the bell, he didn't answer. She did what he thought she would do, and that's go and look around the side and peek in the window, and she sees him with Lisa Andrews. And he does that on purpose to make her jealous. That's scenario A. Scenario B, this is utter bullshit and it didn't happen. Which would you choose? I would choose option B. Yeah, I would as well. That night, he encouraged you to come over. Is that what you're telling us? He, well, he didn't encourage me. He just gave me permission. I needed to get my social security card. 
Okay. This issue of this discussion you had with Travis uh, about this girl, you were you angry during this discussion? No. I was actually frightened a little bit. What do you mean? Right. I was not, I guess, frightened isn't the word, but intimidated. I didn't want to be confrontational. I wanted to just throw it out there and let him know it's okay. If you're dating someone, you can let me know. I'm going to be cool about that, but I want to know rather than sticking around and, you know, while he kept giving me intermittent doses of incentive to stay and believe in him, you know, we can just be friends and draw a line right now, and you can have your life and I'll have mine, and it's okay. I just wanted to know, that's all. You made a comment before we get too far off that on um, confrontation. Uh, you said you didn't want to be confrontational just a second ago. You also made the comment during your, uh, during your time with last week that you weren't allowed to be confrontational with Travis. What do you mean by that? Um, there are a few times when I asserted myself and he checked it very quickly. Checked it how? Usually by verbally snapping back was how it usually went. More like she was the one who snapped back. Yeah, it's just projection. She's uh, projecting her own behavior onto Travis. She was the aggressive one. And whenever he was, was so audacious or dared to say anything back, she quickly checked him, didn't she? She did. She is so full of crap. When these verbal, when he snapped back verbally, did this cause fear in you? I felt, at first I felt more like a chastised child. Um, eventually it began to instill fear and intimidation. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the noon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 125. Please remember the ammunition. You are excused. Have a nice lunch. Several plates of green beans later. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermy, you may continue. Before you do that, ladies and gentlemen, did any of you hear or see anything about this case on the media since I last asked you that question? Has anyone tried to speak with you or influence you in any way about this case? I see no hands to either question. Thank you, Mr. Nermy. You may now continue with redirect. Thank you. Ms. Arias, before we broke for lunch, we were talking about uh, the discussion you were having with Mr. Alexander uh, after you found him making out with this girl. Do you recall that this morning? Yes. Okay. And I believe your words were in prior testimony something to the effect that you wanted to understood where you stood in terms of, of the relationship. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you also mentioned a, a on direct examination you said that he was still I believe your word was courting you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, what do you mean at this time period that Mr. Alexander was still courting you? What do you mean by that? Well, after we broke up, he promised he would change and, you know, he wanted me to move down there, so he paid for me to move down there. Um, and so I, you know, he would still take me out. We'd go on dates and that kind of thing. Um, he wanted to spend his birthday with me. So those are just things that I felt we were kind of just testing the water to see if maybe we could trust each other again or that kind of thing. Um, so when I saw him, I mean, I knew we were still like not together, still single, but when I saw him with that girl, I thought maybe I should ask if he is dating someone else and just hasn't told me or find out what the status is so that I can find out where, I'm, where I stand. Okay. A fictional woman in a very similar situation called Alex Forrest 
um, witnessed kind of a similar situation and her reaction was to throw up. I'm guessing that was Jodie's first instinct as well. Yeah, but the thing is, she knew where she stood. Yeah. She was uh, Travis's bit on the side and yeah, she couldn't she... handle it. No, she couldn't. She wanted to be in his life number one. Do you know something? I, I'm pretty convinced that, you know, she was, she knew that she was a failure at this relationship. She knew that she ruined any chance that she might have stood at becoming his wife and she ruined it. And this is now what she's doing now is her payback for Travis making her feel that way. That's how narcissists think. Yeah, that's true. So for this, that's just kind of something that's occurred to me. That could be kind of motive for what she's doing at the moment and why she feels absolutely no guilt for doing it. She'll never feel guilt. Nah, she's not capable. And this conversation you had with him about questioning him where you stood in the greater scheme of things, uh, that is what led him to run up and beat his head against the wall? Is this the same conversation? Or well, same? It, that wasn't the part. It was the part where I reminded him about how he said I could come over last night and it like a flash of realization crossed his face and he, I think he just, I mean, I don't know what he was thinking, but I could tell after that part, he changed. He got upset. Okay. Big smile on her face as she said that. Um, maybe... I mean, she's rehearsed this, it's obvious, but maybe to, you know, um, lull the jury into thinking that she is recalling a pleasant memory or a memory that she finds amusing or is pleasant to recollect. Yeah, I reckon it has been rehearsed because she also needs to try and get a story straight and also answer spontaneously. Yeah, so completely rehearse this. Um, also, I think a huge element of Duper's delight, I'm getting one over on them here, and they're going to believe me on this. That's what I think, anyway. I don't think they'd believe her. And I'm a little confused then, because when you went to have a soup pie, you had told us that, uh, you know, we heard on cross-examination about uh, this backpack and supposedly full of makeup and that you and Travis were having a fight about that. Do you recall being asked about that on cross-examination? Yes. Okay. And the other issue there was that you had told us in prior testimony that there was a fight going on in the bathroom or bedroom bathroom um, behind closed doors that Mr. Uh, Freeman, Dan Freeman, wasn't privy to. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And this argument, if I recall correctly, related to uh, your interaction with John Dixon. Is that correct? Um, yes, it did. He read my about that interaction in my journal. Okay. So... And refresh our memory, if you could briefly, what interaction are we talking about? I went, um, at one point, it was right before convention, so it would have been maybe late August. I drove out to, um, South, I think it was Irvine, and hung out with John. We just hung out, spent the weekend together, um, traded files, traded uh, music files, movie files. Okay. Um, went to the beach, went to dinner, that kind of thing. Watched a movie. Well, I, I'm a little confused, though. Why was it okay for Travis to be making out with this girl and for you not to be seen or not to hang out with John Dixon? Well, I was under the impression at the time that it wasn't because I was hanging out with another guy, but because of who the guy was. So that's what I believed then, but the same pattern continued with other guys also. Okay. And who the guy was is because, um, at least at this point in time when you were in Irvine with him, he was not a church member. I believe that's what you told us earlier, correct? 
Um, he was not a church member, yes. He, his grandfather was a member of the church, married outside the church, so his children and grandchildren, which would be also be John, were not church members. Okay. And this girl that he was making out with, was her status as a church member ever verified? I didn't ask. That's crap. I reckon that Jody knew exactly who Lisa was and whether she was a member of the church or not. Well, I think she was a member of the church. Yeah. So she definitely knew who she was. Yeah. And if she was among Travis's circle of friends, then, you know, she definitely would have known who Lisa was. So, mm. you know, um, she's talking absolute crap here. But then again, she always talks absolute crap. I guess that means no, huh? No. Yes, that means no. What are you talking about? Okay. Asking about the approach. May continue. This girl that Travis was making out with was it ever asserted that it was okay? Don't worry about it because she's a church member. No, that was never discussed. None of your goddamn business! Now, the issue of your sex life with Travis came about in a lot of, a lot of different ways throughout this case. One of the things that was discussed last week when Mr. Martinez spoke to you is this idea that maybe before he met you that Mr. Alexander was a virgin. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. She's never asked that. Approach, please. <laughs> Remind us again in terms of the sexual behavior you engaged in with Mr. Alexander. What was the first occasion of sexual interaction? Uh, the weekend following convention. Okay, and where did that take place? At his friend's house in Marietta. And if I remember correctly, that was oral sex. Yes. <laughs> If it's possible for you to make conclusions like this, based on this sexual interaction, uh, were you of the mindset that Mr. Alexander had no sexual experience prior to this encounter? No, I was not based on that interaction and other things he told me prior to it. So he never led you to believe that he was a virgin through his words. No, if anything, he led me to believe the exact opposite. The exact opposite being what? Um, he had he had more sexual partners than I've had, but mine have been over a longer range of time. That lion sack of shit. Okay. You also mentioned um, somewhere down the road after that first sexual encounter, the, well, let me ask you, the second sexual encounter, that was the oral sex in your car, correct? That's correct. Did he do anything during that encounter that led you to believe that maybe this wasn't his first rodeo, so to speak? <coughs> Objection. She has already indicated that they already had sex, so, I mean, relevance is the objection. Approach, please. Yes. So, it, did he do anything to make you believe that this wasn't his first encounter of this nature? Um, yes, he flipped the visor down and angled the mirror so he could have 
um, an additional uh, visual vantage point. Okay. You also mentioned uh, during your testimony that there was a time uh, when Mr. Alexander performed oral sex on you and your testimony was, I believe, something to the effect that he knew what he was doing. Is that right? Yes. And without getting too graphic, if you will, what gave you that impression? Um, well, he had bragged about it prior to that, um, somewhat. Um, that he had studied the female anatomy. And so I was, even though I wasn't expecting things to go that far that night, um, once they did, it was obvious that to me that he knew what he was doing. I mean, I've had other intimate relationships in the past, so I was able to make a comparison in my mind. Okay. Now, was there ever a point in time that he ever compared your sexual skills with those of other women? Approach, please. Do you remember the question? Yes. Of course she remembers because it's about her getting munched out, isn't it? Yeah, she always remembers the questions about sex. Yeah, but ask her anything about the murder and it's all... I don't remember, I don't know. Yeah, pathetic, isn't it? Yeah. The answer is yes. Okay. Yes, meaning he did compare your sexual skills to those of other women. Yes. Overruled, that answer will stand. Did he ever compare parts of your anatomy to those of other women? Yes, Overruled, do you mean answer yes or no? Yes, he does on the 16th. Okay. Now, you brought up the sex tape. That's a reference to the phone call you uh, you recorded at his behest on May 10th, 2008? Yes. Okay. Did you hear that then, Nermi saying at his behest? I heard that. Right, okay. So we are supposed to believe that Travis said to Jodie, right, I want you to record this call, and Jodie is like, okay. I seriously doubt that. Because if Jodie is a Mormon and she took her faith seriously, like she's trying to convince this jury, there is no way she'd want to record that call because she would have as much to lose as Travis. Exactly. And I don't even think that Travis knew he was being recorded. He didn't. He didn't. This was all in case he met someone, um, he got into a relationship with someone, started dating someone seriously. She was going to send this to them, I think. Probably, yeah. 100%, I think, that. Uh, a lot was brought up there. So before we get into that a little more specifically, I want to talk about um, your uh, prior sexual history because that was talked about a little bit during your cross-examination. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. And he went into microscopic detail on her sex life on his examination. Yeah, that's right. God help us if we've got to go through that again. I think I'd pop my own raisins if we did. I hope not. One of the issues that came up is, is your history, if you will, for lack of a better word, with anal sex. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Oh, somebody kill me, please! And one of your partners, one of your first relationships, we heard uh, throughout your testimony, 
was with someone named Bobby Juarez, right? That's right. Okay. And in fact, there was a point in time where you were living with him and sexually active with him, right? Yes. Okay. And if memory serves, you would have been about 17. Um, yes, I was almost 18. Okay. And he was a few years older than you? Yes, three years older than me. Okay. One of the things that came up was the idea that you had uh, engaged in anal sex with Mr. Juarez. Uh, do you remember talking about that with Mr. Martinez? Yes. Okay. In this regard, was this anal sex something you did on a frequent basis with Mr. Juarez? No, it was something we tried once, maybe twice, I think just once. Okay, something that you tried once or twice throughout the course of your entire relationship. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Bullshit. And as it relates to uh, Matt McCartney, that would have been your next significant relationship. I believe, if I understood you correctly, you testified that you never had anal sex with Matt McCartney. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And as it relates to Mr. Brewer, uh, a three and a half to four year relationship, right? Yes. It's amazing that guy's still walking around with some semblance of a sanity after three to four years spent with her, isn't it? I know, I'm surprised. <laughs> well, at least he's lucky. Yeah, at least he escaped. Yeah. Was there anal sex involved in that relationship? Um, I want to say one time, I think, maybe twice, but I can only remember one specifically. So based on that, it was certainly not a regular part of your repertoire with Mr. Brewer, right? Definitely not. Okay. And Mr. Brewer would have been the sexual partner that directly preceded Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. Okay. So at the time, and just for just for clarity's sake, uh, you had had these relationships with these men. Are these Mr. Brewer and Mr. Juarez? Are they the only people you ever, prior to Mr. Alexander, had anal intercourse with? Yes. Okay. Huh. I'm the rest. Yeah, I don't think we've got all year though. No. So based on what you've told us in your testimony before you met Travis in your sexual history you would have had anal sex no more than four times is that accurate that's accurate okay now when you started engaging in sexual activity with Mr. Alexander. We've heard how part of that included anal sex, correct? Yes. Well, not in the beginning. Right. Not the beginning, but we heard about the first instances, instance, excuse me, of anal sex occurring after your baptism, right? That's right. Okay. I don't buy that. I think that she introduced anal sex to him uh, i won't put it past her she probably did she probably enjoys it i think she did it a lot more than that um but i reckon when they first got together you know he kind of said i'm not a virgin but i'm i'm conflicted about having sex because of my you know religious beliefs and you know he teaches her about the law of chastity and she says well you know you can stick it up the poop hole it isn't violating your you know Re religious beliefs and I've had it done before numerous times and I like it yeah so Travis probably thought well she's into that she likes it 
and it doesn't necessarily you know violate any of the doctrines or anything no and it's not in danger of getting a pregnant either no so that's probably why he decided to do it and let's face it he was a young man with hormones you know like raging so any excuse to have a little bit of you know sexual contact or sexual intercourse from from someone who you know was kind of frustrated with his own sexuality because of his religious beliefs so i 100 percent believe that she introduced him to anal sex not the other way around she's once more projecting of course she is she's trying to make out that he was the dominant one yeah that he corrupted her and he she's so full of crap isn't she she is and that was not anything you would ask for right yes I is that anything you asked for? No, I didn't ask for that. Was lubrication used during this encounter? Not to my knowledge. I think he might have spit on his hand, but I didn't see. I just kind of was going with what I was hearing. Okay. But be gentle and use lubricant. What did, what did he say? And uh, you described this encounter is being painful to you if i recall is that right <laughs> was this a painful encounter for you yes it was painful that time now i ask that because one of the things that you talked about with mr martinez is your sex life with Mr. Alexander and you had said a, a comment that you enjoyed it it was mutual something to that effect on on several different occasions do you remember that yes he said I asked this because relevance sustained and there was much rejoicing You made comments about enjoying your sex life with Mr. Alexander and saying that it was mutual. Do you remember doing that? Yes. Okay. When you talk about enjoying it, was that physically enjoying it? Yes, it was physical. Most of the time, yes. Sometimes or all the time? Not all the time, but more than sometimes. There were some instances, though, as you just told us, that it was painful, correct? Yes. Okay. That painful interaction on the day of your baptism was that enjoyable to you and on any level that particular segment was not enjoyable at all you also mentioned that there were times you just testified that there were times that it wasn't excuse me physically pleasurable on those times when it wasn't physically pleasurable, did you get something else out of it? Yes, I did. What was that? Um, it made me feel good to make him feel good. Here I go again. And also when I was making him feel good, he had all of his attention focused on me, so I feel like it was still you know, like a trade-off, kind of. I mean, like, I like the way I felt when he was focused on me that way, and I like the way I felt when I could make him feel good, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, let's try to make a little more sense out of that with one of the encounters. You told us that there were occasions when you would come out onto the porch, uh, nude, perform oral sex upon him and he would ejaculate on your face. Remember yes. telling us about that? Yes. Okay. 
Was that physically punishable to you? Um, I wouldn't say there was any physical pleasure that I derived from it. So using, kind of talking about what you told us just a moment ago, what kind of pleasure did you get out of it? Is that the pleasure of pleasing him? Is that what we're talking about? Yes, it had been a fantasy he'd had for over a year um, that I had known him. And so it was something that we hadn't fulfilled in the past and we're able to do it now based on the configuration of the porch of the house that I lived in. Yeah, her fantasies, not his. Okay. You also, when you were asked about this, this sex you had with Travis, you made the comment, you made the comment on direct that you felt like a used piece of toilet paper. Do you recall that? Yes, that was that one time during my baptism. During right. your baptism. But there was also kind of a, maybe not that exact comment, but a similar comment you made when you drove home, when you were driving home from Ehrenberg. Do you remember that? Yes. What was your mindset there in terms of the sexual activity? Well, my mindset didn't really develop until after a few days of him not contacting me or returning any of my attempts to contact him. I drove away kind of with a little bit of a sinking feeling because we didn't really, he wasn't very affectionate when we parted, just kind of blah, just sort of checked out. Um, so I thought maybe he's just tired. And just as the days began to go by, the whole weekend went by and I didn't hear from him until Tuesday night. So by that point I thought that I'd just been really dumb. This trip to Ehrenberg was eventful, wasn't it? But not for the reason she's saying. No, they probably had ma massive, massive arguments. Yeah, I think so. And I'm guessing that she was the, the main catalyst of them. Yeah, and when Travis saw her for who she really was, he thought, no. Yeah, and wanted to put distance between, you know, him and her. But like we said before, he couldn't resist her. He was, you know, he, he found her really attractive. He, you know, she, she pushed his buttons sexually. Yeah, and she knew how. And he couldn't, you know, she couldn't stay away from him and he couldn't stop accepting her into his bed. It's, it's such a shame, isn't it, this? Yeah, considering how it ended. And that was, and I, and I think I used the wrong explanation. That, I believe, you testified to that you felt used like a prostitute on that occasion, right? It kind of reminded me of that, yes. But that, you weren't feeling that way while the activity was taking place, but only afterwards when you were driving home. Is that? Yes, after I just sort of reflected on it and how it all came about. Nope, she drove home with a big smile on her face and white stains on her car seat. Okay. Now it seems all this sexual, continued sexual interaction after you broke up and even after in January of 2008 was motivated based on what you've told us on two things. There was a sexual component to it. Is that accurate? A physical component to it, I should say. Will you repeat? Will you start over? I'm sorry. Sure. The, the, the sexual activity you had with Mr. Alexander after you broke up, the continued all the way uh, until June 4th, there was a physically gratifying component of that on most occasions, right? Yes. And there was a seemingly always, whether it was physically gratifying to you or not, an emotionally satisfying component to you for making him happy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Once again, projecting, isn't she? Yep, as always. She was in that relationship not to keep Travis happy, but so that Travis could he keep her happy. She knew what hold 
she had over him. Yeah, it was just to... She weren't thinking about his feelings. No. She was thinking about herself and what she could get out of it. Yeah, she has spent her whole time, however many days she has been on this stand, describing Travis's behaviour as her own and her own behaviour as Travis's, and it is disgusting. It's absolutely despicable. And how those four siblings can sit there calm... I bet inside the raging, I would be, but how they can sit there composed, I've just got so much respect for them. Well, they're the better people. <laughs> much better people. Was there any other reasons why you continued to have sexual relations with him after you broke up? Well, after, after I walked in on him... Reasons. She's explaining the reasons, Judge. Explain the reasons. Okay. Um, there weren't any other reasons prior to January 21st, 2008, but there were after that. And the reason was I was under the impression that he felt, well, he felt more satiated and um, more, he felt more normal when he had just more adult interactions, if that makes sense. So there was a component of assistance, if you will, in your sexual activity, assisting Travis. I would say that. I, I wasn't looking at it that way, but it was much like that, yes. By normal adult interactions or whatever, shite term she used i'm guessing that she's going to double down on these ridiculous claims that travis was attracted to children of course she's going to use that but we all know that's crap yeah um and i don't think one member of the jury believes it either uh, i don't think one member of the gallery maybe apart from donovan believes it either so um it just goes to show you just what a disgusting human being we're dealing with here yeah she, how she would stoop so low yeah Moving ourselves to the tape. Well, let's, before we get to the tape. Well, here's a quarter called someone who cares. Let's talk about uh, some of the text messages without going through the specifics of them, but there were several things that were brought up. Um, in these text messages, things that you said. Um, you made the comment in the text message that you wanted to have sex with him like a horny little schoolgirl. Do you remember being shown that message? Yes. Okay. And if you could speak up? Yes. Why would you send a message like that to him what was the purpose um well the schoolgirl thing was one of his fantasies and during it only shows the two messages but that was a long thread of back and forth back and forth on my way back from las vegas while i was driving and so it just kept escalating and that's when he sent me another picture of himself and um we just kept trying to top ourselves so we were trying to get more and more graphic and explicit Oh, so her reference to the sexualization of children is completely innocent. Right, I see. It's one rule for her, isn't it? If she said she was trying to help him, I think that's crap. Yeah, it's... She's into... She's... Gets off on it. This is just a sick fantasy of hers and nothing more. Nobody buys it. Well... In that regard, though, was that... The idea of the schoolgirl in that outfit, was that something that, that you were interested in or was it something you were doing to please him? Um, it would be more for his pleasure because just being with him was enough for me, but um, he enjoyed that kind of stuff, so yeah. Okay. So in terms of your sex life, Prior to Mr. Alexander, uh, you didn't dress up as a schoolgirl. 
No, I didn't dress up as anything prior to him. Okay. You also made the comment in some of these text messages um, that you wanted to give him a blowjob. BJ, which is probably what you put in the text messages. Why did you send him text messages to that effect? Um, well, we just had a sex life and it just kept things interesting. You slash cat! Okay. Why was it important to you for things to stay interesting? It depends on the timeline. Um, but I enjoyed spending time with him and usually the only times that we spent together where it was enjoyable was when he was focused on me in that sort of manner. Um, Did you hear that? Focused on me. Yep. That line right there tells you who she is. Pure narcissist. Usually after that it would be if we were in public spending time together, we weren't really doing anything or interacting in any sort of pleasant way. Um, Pay attention to me. And if we were not engaging in intimate things um, and we were alone together, then sometimes we were just fighting. So it was more pleasant to be loving, I guess, for lack of a better word. And it sounds like you engaged in these sexual encounters so you could get love and affection back from Mr. Alexander. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. Six hours later. Are you telling us that this, you were willing to pay this price in order to get this affection from Mr. Alexander? I wouldn't term it like that, but, but when I, when I did. God, he's all over this, isn't he, Martinez? He is, every step of the way, yeah. objection after objection. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd. Just don't, I just don't think he wants her to start waffling on. I mean, you know, thank God for that. Well, Nermi let her waffle on too long last time. Oh, yeah. Well, Nermi will indulge you till the cows come home. He's, you know, she's his client. Yeah, that's true. You wouldn't put it like that. How would you put it? Um, I would just put it as spending time with him. That's how I looked at it, spending time with him, um, doing things that he liked to do. <laughs> Were, I received um, a good reaction from him, so in turn, I like to do those things too, for those reasons. Okay. In those text messages that you were shown, uh, you also make reference to, you know, wanting a facial, to. Um, you know, his penis being a lollipop. Boom, boom, boom. Were you doing that along the same reasons that we were talking about before, to get his approval or to keep it interesting for him? Yes, we stained. Why did you make comments of that nature in the text messages? Well, again, with those particular text messages, we were trying to top each other. We kept going back and forth. It got more and more graphic, more and more explicit. And every t we were trying to just be witty. So every time I topped his comment, he tried to top mine. And it was something that we did back and forth on a few occasions, more than a few occasions. But it, that was just part of our relationship. So that's how we interacted at times. And you've got positive reinforcement from those texts as well, is that fair to say? Yes, I did. Judge, can we approach you? Okay. Gentlemen, please go back to the jury room for a few minutes. It probably will be 10 to 15 minutes. Please remember the admonition. You are excused.
The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. But ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Mr. Nermi, you may continue outside the presence of the jury. Problem being right now, the system seems to be. It's rebooting. Take just a second. The way you mounted it, it sounds like. Sounds like it was 12 year old girl having her first orgasm. It's so hot. It sounds like. Sounds like what? The 12 year old girl having her first orgasm. I check up every day, sometimes two to three times a day. Are you serious? There's been many times when you've been like miserable and I've like raped you. You, you cannot say I don't work that booty. Oh, never mind. You do know how to work the booty. <laughs> yeah, we've had two and three hour sessions many times. Yeah, yeah. I think three and a half is like our top or something. You remember that time I came to visit you when I was still working in California and I fell asleep on your chair next to your bed? And you just like woke me up by pulling my pants off and totally licking my pussy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you gotta admit though, like, there's not many guys that we can do that just for fun. When you pick cherries, the darker the red, the riper the fruit. I'm gonna tell you to the tree and put it in your ass, by the way. What's that? I'm gonna tie you to a tree and put it in your ass. I'm going to zip, zip tie your arms around the tree, blindfold you, and uh, put the picture, the camera on a timer while I'm parking you. Just think of how how I pounded you with a full six year old pop until it was nothing. I didn't like the pop rock as much as I liked the six year old pop though. Like you ride my freaking face. Yeah. I'm sorry, but this proves absolutely nothing. No, Does absolutely it? not. It just goes to prove that Travis had a healthy sexual fantasies. Um, I don't think any of those really regarded extreme violence. No, he's not saying I want to beat you up. No, and most of all, none of them include children. No, none of them. He's not even mentioned it. You would think that if he had that interest, he would want to incorporate Jody into that interest and voice his fantasies in that vein on this phone call, but no mention, is there? 69, six. I'm going to get some great shots of freaking put that in here. Like the actual putting it in you and like your reaction and just the angles and the the whole bit. Seriously, honey, I don't want to close you right now for that. Because I'm touching yourself. I can't wait to get pictures of jizzle on your face. I'll try to get one as I'm coming up your face. I want to give you a cream pie, too. What's that? What's a cream pie? I'm going to blow my wand right just like a quarter inch inside your pussy. I mean, it could be like legitimate porn. Yeah. In every sense, you know what I mean? Everything about like the details of your body are so hot. Yeah. Like those big, freaking nipples. I could come at any moment. From my dick and every of your body. Because I want to get like some like hard crazy kind of outfit for me to wear. Oh, honey, the pictures I'm going to take are so hot. If one of them's going to be me laying on my back, cock hard, you know, stick it straight out. So we'll take some video too. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Mm. I just did like 15 pumps. Which is surprising because, you know, I drank it this morning. Seriously, I could have, uh, I was at a sperm bank, I could have retired off this load. Well, I'm going to stand corrected here after all of that, because I have said that Jody is stooped lower than low, but I have to say that her defence team has as well. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, what was the point of that? Yeah, it was just to score points. It was just to 
what is really bothering me is that a murderer is using a dead man's voice to try and exonerate her of murdering him. And uh, that's what I find disgusting. His his voice is being used. He he is speaking from a take, tape. He cannot, he is not here to speak what he would think now. No, and his family have to sit there and listen to that. I mean, you know, one of my brothers is dead. One of them's still alive. But if I heard a sex tape of those, I'd probably be straight to the toilet, you know, having a word with Huey, Ralph and Yuri Gagarin. Absolutely. But what they've done, the defence, in doing this is just despicable. And if they have done this at Jody's direction, then they've probably sunk a new low in their lives. Um, I know that, I'm, you know, we're trying to give Nermi a lot of latitude on this because of the illness that he later suffered. But for this, he's lost some points with me. Absolutely, with me too. I mean, I don't even, it wasn't even relevant. We've seen some truly disgusting moments in this trial, haven't we? We and have. I've got to say, that's one of them. Counsel. All right, let's bring in the jury. Yes. Okay. Take a break at 320. Sure. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. While you were in the jury room, the court admitted Exhibit 509. Exhibit 509 is a portion of Exhibit 460. In a few moments, defense counsel will play Exhibit 509 for you. As it is being played, you will see words appear on the screen. It is up to you to determine the accuracy of the words you see on the screen as you listen to the recording. The exhibit admitted and the exhibit that will go with you back to the jury room will not have the words on it. Those words are being provided at this time to assist you as you listen to the portions of Exhibit 460. Are there any questions? Mr. Nermi, you may continue. Ms. Arias, as it relates to uh, Exhibit 460, you were here in court when that was played, correct? Yes. Okay. And you recall being asked some questions about um, fantasy and reality as it relates to this tape. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. What I want to do for you now is play some snippets of the tape and ask you some questions. If you could just watch as we go. Okay. Right, so originally we were going to just cut this bit out because we didn't want to subject you to sitting through this again. And we didn't. <laughs> we didn't want to do it either. But it appears that he's going to go through each snippet and ask her questions about it. Now, we're looking forward to this as much about as much as we're looking forward to a red hot poker up our jacksies, aren't we? Yeah, but I mean, it's totally irrelevant. But... um. Let's do this together and let's weather through it, yeah? Yeah. The way you know it sounds like it sounds like you're this twelve year old girl having her first orgasm. It's so hot. <laughs> Can you see that quote on the screen? Yes. Was that something that you wanted him to say or encouraged him to say? I didn't encourage him to say it. Watch. Watch. Is it something you wanted him to say? I just wanted him to say what he wanted to say. 
I didn't get specific. Okay. And going back to the question of fantasy or reality for him, do you know if this was fantasy or reality? Um, well, sustained. Do you know if it's fantasy or reality? Or if you don't know, you don't know. I, I don't know. I I think it was fantasy. She, she doesn't know anything else. Sustained. You weren't 12 at the time of this phone call, were you? No. Okay. Oh, fuck. Fantasy or reality is kind of gross either way, isn't it? Objection. The state. Yeah, this is a dead man you're talking about. Do you know what I mean? A man murdered by your client. Yeah, he's stooping so low to bloody say that. Yeah, have some respect. Let's move on to the next highlight. Sounds like what? The 12-year-old girl out of her first show again. I check up every day, sometimes two, three times a day. Are you serious? There's been many times when you've been like miserable and I've like raped you. You were asked about, going back to the previous clip, you were asked about his masturbation habits or that you inspired them. Um, did you somehow dictate how often he masturbated? No. Um, he also says there, are, there have been many times when you have been miserable, like miserable, and I've like raped you. Um, is that fantasy or is that reality? Um, that's reality, but he doesn't mean like, um, like rape, like how the law defines it. I don't think. Did you have fantasies about being raped by Mr. Alexander? Not rape, just maybe like ravished or something, but not raped, I would say. The language that Travis used in that particular portion is open to interpretation. Yeah, we have our opinions and we're sure you have yours. Yeah, on what he meant. So we will leave it at that. Come on. You, you cannot say I don't work that booty. Oh, never mind. You do know how to work the booty. <laughs> yeah, we've had two and three hour sessions many times. Yeah, yeah. This two hour, three hour sessions, is that a reference to the reality of your sex life with him prior to May 10th, 2008? Yes, prior to moving back to California. I feel as though we've gone back in time, do you? Yeah, it's like we're stuck in a bloody time warp. Yeah, I mean, we've gone through all of this. He's, he went with a forensic tooth comb through the, the whole her whole sex life for days, and now we're doing it again. Why is he so focused on their sex life? There are other aspects of this. We do not need to drag this up again, do we? No, there are more important, relevant things to be talking about. Do you know, in our comments, many of our viewers have said that Nermi seems obsessed with their sex life, and we've defended him, haven't we? We have, but I we, think they're right. We're finding it harder and harder to defend him here. We're starting to suspect that he is, that, or that he was at least obsessed with their sex life, and he wanted it paraded in front of the jury, in front of the public gallery, but worst of all, in front of millions of viewers on national television. Yeah, I'm sure he gets off on it. Yeah, and us nine years later, <laughs> and you lot. And in those two and three hour sessions, 
based on what you told us before, you enjoyed most of those physically, but also because of the fact that you were making him happy. Is that right? Is it accurate that part of the reason for these sessions was not only the physical satisfaction, but the positive attention you got from him during those times? Sustained. You get positive attention from him during those two or three hours? Yes, I did. And you enjoyed that positive attention, right? Sexually. Overall, do you mean answer? Yes, always. Do you remember that time I came to visit you when I was still living in California? And I fell asleep on your chair next to your bed. And you just like woke me up by pulling my pants off and totally licking my pussy. Yeah. Uh, that's, you gotta admit though, like there's not many guys that would just, that do that just for fun. I'm gonna tell you to the tree and put it in your ass, by the way. The, as it relates to the previous clip, the fact that Mr. Alexander wanted to perform oral sex on you for such a lengthy period of time, was that something that made you feel good? Since he woke her up that way, that two or three hour session. Okay, when he woke you up and you were asleep, you weren't conscious and consenting to that activity. Is that correct? Rephrase. You were asleep the time he referred to just in that call, right? You were asleep when he took your pants off. Yes, I woke up in the process. I was sleeping. You can give me a hard on. And because you were asleep, you didn't consent to him doing any of those things before you woke up. Is that accurate? Sustained. Would it be fair to say that you didn't consent to anything because you were asleep? Sustained. Could when you're asleep, can people talk to you and ask you questions, yes or no? You would answer them if you're asleep? Um, not if I'm actually sleeping. Maybe okay. I would. So when you were asleep on this chair, did Miss Alexander say, hey, Jody, can I take your pants off and have oral sex with you? That's my point. To me, answer. Um, did you ask if I would know? Or? No, I asked, did, did Travis say to you while you were sleeping, hey, Jody, can I take your pants off and perform oral sex? No. How would she know if she's asleep? So, objection. objection, he has no foundation. It was already overruled. Oh, overruled. There's, you may proceed. Were you flattered by the fact that he wanted to do that to you for that long? Objection, he's characterizes. Yeah, but it's a foundation. Do that what? For that, what more? Sustained us to foundation. Okay, Jody. Were you flattered by the fact that he wanted to perform oral sex upon you for a long period, the two to three hour period of time, or the long period of time he talked about in the tape? Objection, questions. You asked him two or three hours or in the tape? Um, well, I, I don't think that that particular time was two or three hours, but. Of course, I was flattered. I, he wanted to surprise me, I think. But yeah, I was flattered. I was kind of embarrassed, but I was flattered. Okay. Now, moving to this next quote. I'm going to tie you to a tree and put it in your ass, by the way. Uh, we heard about prior instances of anal sex prior to May 10th. Uh, so is this 
fantasy or is this reality? We're kicking around ideas of what we might do. Um, I hope that was fantasy because I don't think I would have gone for that. Lying bitch. But I'm not sure whether or not he had serious intentions of doing that act or not. But did you ever, you said you don't think you would submit to that, but did you ever do anything to try to make this fantasy happen? Yes. What did you do? He asked me to find a place that would be good where we could do that, and so I hiked around a little bit and thought it was near this park that's mostly wooded um, toward the south end of town. And I figured if we, I was trying to think of the best time so that, you know, it's kind of in public so that nobody would stumble upon us. So just that, basically. Hang on a minute. So she said that that's one of his fantasies and that she wouldn't go for that, yet she hikes around for miles looking for a convenient spot. What? Does that is does that make sense to anyone else? Because it doesn't to me. It doesn't make sense. She's contradicting herself constantly. I mean, what the hell? I mean, you know, if you don't want to go for something, you'd say, piss off, I'm not doing that. You know, and I'm not hiking miles in the woods, you know, invoking the bloody Blair Witch Project or some <laughs> shit, just to find a place where you can tie me to a tree and, you know, give me one up the bloody rear entrance. I'm sorry. You know, I've got to give me a bit of dignity. But no, none of that. Oh, yeah, I'll go and hike because it pleases you. Yeah, um, more like it pleased her. Yeah. Sorry for that Kermodian rant there, but I just felt it was important to say. So this might have been one of those fantasies that might have become a reality. Let's go on to the next quote. I'm going to tie you to a tree and put it in your ass. I'm going to zip tie your arms around the tree blindfold you and uh put the picture the camera on time while I'm parking it. Just think of how how I pounded you with a full six year old pop until it was nothing. The quote we just heard I, I was a little late on hitting the pause button, but the quote we just heard about Tootsie Pops. Uh, that was a reference to the encounter, uh, the day, I should say, the day that Mr. Alexander, you and Mr. Alexander took a bath and that was used later on. Objection leading for more than one occasion when they engaged in this conduct. Continue your question. It is, is the, the day you used the Tootsie Pop, is that also the day you took a bath with Mr. Alexander? Yes. There was much discussion uh, last week when Mr. Martinez was speaking with you about whether you enjoyed that encounter or not. And I believe you said that you had enjoyed aspects of that encounter. Is that correct? That would be correct. Okay. It was definitely her idea. Yeah, I completely agree. And do you know why? Why? Because Travis was, well, been, been a devout Mormon all his life. All he's known is the Mormon church. He's not going to be that sexually adventurous. No, not as widely as she is. I mean, he wasn't a virgin. We know that. But we're guessing that he lost his virginity to somebody who was in the Mormon church or slept with people in the Mormon church. Whereas she's a bit more worldly wise and a lot more promiscuous and I'm betting that you're right, it was her idea because she would be a bit more adventurous and certainly a bit more perverse if you like. Even though it's not perverse, it's just, if you like Tootsie Rolls, you'll never eat another one again, will you? Well, exactly. Which aspects did you enjoy? Um, well... I think we used bubbles that time with the bath, so I enjoyed that. Um, I guess the Tootsie Pop was just 
for fun. Um, I enjoyed his attention. I didn't really like the pop rocks as much, how he wanted to use them. So that was probably one of the two or three hour things he was talking about okay. because it lasted a while. Well, to clarify then what you were asked on cross-examination, when he was using the Tootsie Pops on you, you weren't enjoying that physically, you were enjoying his atten the attention you were getting from him. Is that correct? Just me. When he was using the Tootsie Pops on you, was it physically, physically pleasurable to you? There was some physical pleasure, I guess. It wasn't uncomfortable or anything. What other pleasure did you derive from that? Um... Christ on a lettuce leaf, does it bloody matter? His attention, I guess. It sounds simple, but it was just about... A, you know, we shut the door and it was our own space and it was just our time together, so I enjoyed that. Okay. I didn't like the pop up as much as I liked the picture on top of them. Like you could ride my freaking face. Yeah, horse. Sit in my face and tell me that you love me. Yeah. Maybe you can 69 picks too. 69 picks? 69, dudes! I'm gonna get some great shots of freaking put that right here. Like the action. talks about getting some great shots, putting it in you. What's that a reference to? Sex. What is he putting in you? Maybe obvious, but what? Um, his penis. And some great shots. There, what is he referring to? Are we talking about taking pictures? Are we talking about making a video? Um, he's talking about the photographs at this point with his new camera that he was excited about. I've got a question. I'm not sure if anyone could answer this for me, but it's one that's just occurred to me, right? Why would someone who wants to take shots of himself putting his penis inside Jody, why would someone like that need to be convinced to do Calvin Klein shots? If someone could answer that question for me, I'd be very grateful. That is a good question. I mean, that just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. No. So that just jumped out at me because when he's talking about taking the photos, he could just be bullshitting. It could just be bullshit. I mean, when you fantasize, you bullshit. Yeah, it could be just the fantasy of his. Yeah. So if he wants to take pictures of himself doing that, why would she need to convince him to do Calvin Klein shots? Now, the answer to this is what I suspect all along. He didn't know she was taking those pictures in the shower. No, that was complete surprise. The Calvin Klein shots explanation is just pure fiction. As it relates to taking nude photographs, is that something that you were completely comfortable with and encouraged? I was never completely comfortable with the nude photographs. But I was willing to, it took a while, like it took, I guess, close to a year and a half, but I was willing to go along with it. We've rewound that so you can see her body language. We're not experts, are we, as we keep saying? No, we're not, but you can tell that she's lying there. Yeah, she's looking really shifty, so just watch that again. I was never completely comfortable with the new photographs, but I was willing to... It took a while, like, it took, I guess, close to a year and a half, but I was willing to go along with it. 
as long as they got deleted. That, and let me see if I can progress a little bit. Try to get one as I'm traveling up your state. This particular act of him ejaculating on your face was mentioned a couple times in these slides. Uh, is that something that you got physical enjoyment out of? Not like physical pleasure actually sometimes it hurt if it got in my eyes but other than that it wasn't uncomfortable but it wasn't you know like my preferred method or anything if you didn't get physical pleasure out of it what if anything did you get out of it um just the it made me feel good to know that he was enjoying himself If he was gratified, I felt better about myself that I was able to provide that gratification for him. You continue on. I want to give you a cream pie, too. What's that? What's a cream pie? Bruh. Prior to Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, excuse me, explaining this cream pie to you. Did you know what it was, what he was talking about? No, I didn't know what that term meant. What I blow my wand, right? Just like a quarter inch inside your pussy. I mean, it could be like legitimate porn. Having him give you this cream pie and making quote unquote legitimate porn, was that something you were willing to do to please him? I was willing to do that. I'm sorry, are we watching a murder trial here or are we watching the dossier of a bloody porn star? Because this is turning more and more into the Jodi Arias arse show than it is a bloody murder trial. I just yeah. wish Nermi would focus. Yeah, focus and move on to the actual important questions. We don't want to hear any more about a goddamn sex life. Yeah, and stop distracting us with details that just do not matter. To please him? Yeah, certainly. Did you have some independent desire on your own to make this porn? Mm, well, not photographing it or filming it or any or recording it or anything like that. Um, okay. No, not like that. Yeah. In every sense, you know what I mean? Everything about like the details of your body are so hot. It was big. Comments like that of a sexual nature about your body, did those make you feel good? Yeah, they made me feel, yeah, they made me feel good. Freaking nipples. I could come at any moment. My dick and every one can see your body. I want to get like some like park ranger type outfit for me to wear. Oh, honey, the pictures I'm going to take are so hot. Like one of them's going to be me laying on my back. Cock hard. Yeah, it could. 
again, going back to these, one of them, is he referring to pictures? Yes, different positions. And again, you said you were uncomfortable and getting more comfortable with this. Is that correct? Or? Um, I, was, I was getting accustomed to the idea of doing it. Were you comfortable with video? Um, I'm kind of self-conscious in front of the lens, but I was willing to try it as long as it got deleted. I was okay with that. Self-conscious in front of the lens, but absolutely no peccadilloes or qualms about laying her sex life in front of millions of people. No. Does she think we're idiots? Yeah, she probably does, but we're not. because, you know, I drank it this morning. Seriously, I could, uh... The fact that you were able to make him, by his words, uh, reach orgasm, we'll put it that way, um, did that make you feel good about yourself? Yeah, I got some, I got satisfaction from doing that. There was well, it, there was an issue raised about uh, fidelity uh, and you kissing Ryan Burns on June 5th. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you recall the testimony of Miss Diodoni, Lisa Diodoni, then Lisa Andrews, um, that she was dating Travis Alexander at the same period of time that you were either in a relationship with Mr. Alexander or having sexual intercourse with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that? I approach. Jody, before we go into some of these issues, if you'd be so kind as to tell us what your belief in terms of what being monogamous in a relationship means. Well, in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but to me it means um, that you're committed to that person, you're not, you know, um, be, you're not with other people, sleeping with other people, or maybe it, there's kind of a gray area, but acting inappropriately with other people out of respect for your boyfriend or girlfriend. On this subject, she remained monogamous to Travis because as far as she was concerned that relationship was not over despite what she says now in this video and at 2013 when this was recorded she never accepted that relationship is was over I don't think do you no she she had a different interpretation she thought that with her still sleeping with Travis that she still had a future with him yeah but Travis didn't see it that way well, if you think about it, by her own admission, since she was with Travis, she didn't go with another guy. She may have, you know, been out to lunch or had a date with a guy or two, but she never 
had sex with them or was never in a relationship with them. According to her. According to her, right? But Travis did. Travis tried to move on. Travis tried to, you know, move on with Lisa Andrews. And she made that pretty much impossible. Well, yeah, she was always hounding him. Yeah. So as far as Travis was concerned, the relationship was over. You know, he was free to date. As far as she was concerned, she never had any intention of dating anyone else. And she wouldn't allow him to date anyone else either. And if he resisted, well, you know what happened. Yeah, there was drama. Yeah, and she also killed him. And I think when she was arrested with the gun and the knives in her car, she was going for Mimi Hall. She was trying to get her before she was caught. That's my theory anyway. Don't know about you. That's a possible theory, but, but fortunately, she never got to her. She, yeah, she didn't get to her. Let us know what you think, uh, whether you think, because it's just come to light to us that these weapons were found in her car when she was arrested. So we think that she was going to take Mimi Hall down before she was arrested, because she knew she was going to get arrested eventually, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, it was obvious. Yeah. Anyway, let us know what you think, guys. As we, you know, we, we always love reading your feedback I know you mentioned um, in your cross-examination that you were I think your words were hyper literal right yes okay in that regard then um, you just define monogamy for us what then to you does infidelity mean Infidelity, I associate a little bit more with marriage, but in a committed relationship, infidelity can also mean if that person was unfaithful in that they pursued something with another person independent of the relationship that that person is in. I think in marriage it goes a little farther. It's more about in your mind and heart as well, not just your actions. Okay. So let me ask you this then as it relates to your relationship with Mr. Alexander. For your definitions and your feeling then, would you have believed or assumed that at the time period that you and Mr. Alexander were boyfriend and girlfriend, that you would have been monogamous? During that time period, yes, I believed that. Okay. And during that time period then, had he been sexual with another woman, would you in your mind define that as an act of infidelity? Sexual meaning sleeping with other people or acting inappropriately? Same. We've heard her use the term officially dating, and albeit for five months, haven't we? Quite a few times in this trial. Yeah. But were they ever actually officially dating? I mean, seriously, exclusively dating? Or were they just friends who were very tactile with each other? You know, good friends, as far as everyone else was concerned. Well, they could have been just friends with benefits, or they could have been dating with... We'll never know but you know if he was seeing lisa andrews at the same time as he was seeing her right then maybe as far as travis was concerned they weren't dating not officially not officially no i mean i'm spitballing here i could be completely wrong but i'm just trying to see it from travis's point of view because all we're hearing is hers if he Travis to me doesn't seem like the type who would cheat maybe he is we don't know no if anyone out there knows let us know please yeah but you know do we have any official proof that they were actually you know seriously dating because if Travis did cheat on her then maybe as far as Travis was concerned they weren't in a relationship or they weren't dating let us know what you think just speculating yeah when you're Mr. Alexander, you and Mr. Alexander are a couple, if he 
kissed another girl? Would that be an act of infidelity? Well, if it's like a relative, no. But yeah, and if it's in a romantic way, of course, yes, I would consider that. Okay. I should have been more clear with your hyperliteral personality, but let's go on then. Uh, it has to be stricken. Sustained. Okay. Uh, so then if he had romantically kissed another girl, that would be infidelity. Uh, would I be correct in assuming then if he engaged in other sexual acts, such as oral sex, that would be an act of infidelity when you were boyfriend or girlfriend? By, in your mind? In my mind, yes, I would consider that infidelity. And anything else of a sexual nature without going through every sexual act in the book, so to speak, that would also be an act of infidelity in your mind. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So refresh our memory then as to the point in time when you were boyfriend and girlfriend, you were in a couplehood, if you will, with Mr. Alexander. Allegedly. Did you say when? When? Um, I would say, I would say February 2nd when we had the conversation to make things official. And, to, and that was 2007 until June 29th, 2007 when we broke up. Okay. So, during that time period, were you aware of any acts that you would define as infidelity? I was not aware. Well, I had a feeling, but I wasn't, I didn't see. Yes. Oh, question now. You said she was not aware. Sustained. Now, The discussion was held about uh, Ryan Burns and you kissing Ryan Burns on June 4th, and that was brought up to whether or not you were being disloyal to Mr. Alexander, correct? Yes. Now, you weren't Mr. Alexander's girlfriend on June 4th of 2008, right? No, I wasn't. Okay. The were you aware of Mr. Alexander engaging in other sexual behavior at the same time, with other individuals at the same time that he was engaging in sexual behavior with you? At what time period? Any time period. Yes. Now, you mentioned We've talked about the uh, time when you went to his home in 2007 and saw him kissing another girl. That'd be one of those instances you're talking about? Where he was with me and also with somebody else? Yes. Um, yes, like not in a committed relationship, but we were physical together in that regard. Were there other instances of that sort of behavior that you were aware of with Mr. Alexander? Yes. Describe those for us. Well, there are things that I became aware of after the fact. Okay. So. Overruled. Next question. So, apart from this action that uh, you saw in 2007, you're not aware of Mr. Alexander at the time, you weren't aware of Mr. Alexander uh, engaging in sexual behavior with anyone else but you and this girl. Is that accurate? Sexual, yes. I saw the romantic gestures, but not sexual. Okay. And that's another thing, isn't it? If Travis's interest was in children, then why did Jody see him kissing a woman? Why did she not see him kissing a child? Exactly, and there was also the fact that he was flirting with women. Yes, 
so she is just a despicable liar. In that regard, though, who is Shaitanya Lay? Shaitanya Lay is a girl that Travis wanted to have a threesome with. Approach, please. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. Since you did have a 15 minute recess about an hour ago, so 10 minutes, please be back in the designated area at 3.35. Please remember the admonition. Let's bring in the jury. Please stand for the jury. It's Groundhog Day! Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermi, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, do you want to move on at this point uh, to talk about your journals? All right? Yes. You were shown uh, Exhibit 455. Three days later. But before we go to that, then, while the system is rebooting, let me show you what's been marked as Exhibit 242.001, if I may approach her. In this regard, Are all the pages in that journal complete? No. Are all the pages that were originally contained in that journal still in there now? No. If you could be so kind, could you hold up for the jury and show us uh, where uh, pages are actually ripped? Um, yes. Do you want dates or anything, or just? No, if you could just physically show. Okay. Torn There's pages. half a page here and a following page that was ripped out. Could you just perhaps stand up and show? Okay. There is half a page here, another page here that was ripped out. There's a piece here. Um, there are other parts also. Sorry, could you speak up? Yeah, there's a few other places in here that where pages were ripped out. I just would have to find them. I think I know by date on one. Around the end of October. Okay. Time for the engine. Yeah. Does it appear there's pages missing out at the entry on September 9th, 2007? Yes. Okay. These pages that were either partially removed or completely removed. How did that come to pass? Section like a foundation she indicated there was more than one area. <clears throat> okay. The page that was torn in half. How did that come to occur? Section like a foundation. Or I mean of that. Well, what do you answer? 
That one, even though chronologically it was before some others, that one was torn out after um, after I removed some pages that I had written in about John Dixon because it caused me so much grief. Okay. The page that were torn, the page, the page you showed us, page or two that were torn in part. Do you recall why you moved those, removed those sections? Or did you, re let's, let's start there. Did you remove those sections? Objection is she said she did. Oh, I removed the, the half page was August 26th, 2007. And I removed that page and the one following it. And why did you remove that partial page and the one following it? It's pretty vague now, but I was just going on and on about suicide. It was pretty negative. Um, there are a lot of entries about that, but this one was just a lot more. I don't know. It was very negative about myself, and I didn't want to. I didn't want it to be in my journal anymore. Well, firstly, who knows what was on those pages? We don't know it was about suicide, do we? No, but then again, if you're going to commit suicide, why write about it? Well. Some people do. Some people, you know, when they can't talk to other people, they confess their innermost feelings to a journal or a diary. But um, nobody knows what was on those pages because she removed them. Presumably they've been destroyed. I um, reckon they had something incriminating. That was my thought. My thought was something was written on there and she realised and thought, yeah, I better take that out. Once again, just spitballing here, aren't we? We are. We're just speculating. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the pages uh, near the entries dated September 9th, 2007, we were looking at how a few of those were removed. Uh, do you recall why those were? Well, let me ask you this. Do you recall who removed those? I removed those ones. Okay. And why did you remove those pages? I removed those ones because they detailed the weekend that I spent with John Dixon. Um, and when Travis read it and exploded, I thought the answer. your answer. They it just caused me so much grief that I didn't want that to even be in there anymore because if I just didn't want it in there anymore in case he was reading it again in the future. Okay, now we saw this journal here. This is the journal that the pages were worked out of, correct? Yes. We saw this journal here, we saw some other journals, and a question was asked of you about the privacy of your journals, right? And so it begins the question, if they were private, why would it matter if you wrote about John Dixon in them? They in any of the journals. They were not private, not as private as I wanted them to be. Not as private as you wanted. Who? besides yourself, had access to your journals? Well, Travis would read them, and also Mormons are encouraged to write journals with the idea in mind that they will pass those journals on to their posterity. So sometimes I would write that with, in mind, with that in mind. Sometimes I was a little more free-flowing, but definitely Travis had read it on several occasions. Not as private as I would like them to be, says the absolute hypocrite who goes through other people's uh, emails and phones. And text messages. Yeah, what an absolute hypocrite. Definitely she is. You mentioned um, posterity, meaning it could be passed down to future generations. Is that what you're telling right. us? Okay. Yes. And would you then, for posterity purposes or any other purpose, not want to have anything negative in your journal? Objection meeting. Overall, Jimmy, yes, sir. That would be one of the reasons. What would the other reason be? Well, there's a few reasons. There's that one. Um, there's also the fact that Travis could potentially read something that I wrote in there. And the biggest reason was 
the law of attraction. It was a huge philosophy of mine at that time in my life. And one of the law, one of the aspects of that law states that you're not to read about. I wanted to check on the rest of the She said at that time, there were three or four journals, there were different time periods. So which time period is she referring to? Okay. The law of attraction, when were you introduced to it? Initially, I was, I became acquainted with it in 1999, or maybe it was 2000, actually. Okay. And was this a principle or a philosophy that you followed from that point on? Not religiously. It was something I was familiar with. Maybe it was in the back of my mind here and there. Um, it certainly had an effect on somewhat on wanting me wanting to be positive, but it wasn't a big part of my life at that time. You say it wasn't a big part of your life at what time? 2000. Okay. Was it a big part of your life between 2006? Well, was it a big part of your life when you were in a relationship, friendship, interacting, what have you, with Mr. Alexander. Yes. Now, in that regard, you've mentioned a couple times that the law of attraction would be a reason why you wouldn't put anything negative in your journals. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Could you explain that? how writing something negative in your journal would contradict with the law of attraction? Yes, I'll do my best to explain it. Um, the idea is that, the idea behind the law of attraction is that we live in a vibrational universe and that you know everything down to the atomic level is vibrating to a certain frequency which creates what you see everywhere, including sound and sight and light and all of that, um, and physical matter. And so the idea is that when you have a certain thought, it begets an emotion, and the emotion changes the vibration on a molecular level within your body, and that that in turn affects your environment around you in a subtle way, and that it can draw negative things or positive things depending on what your predominant thoughts are. Um, it's it in that regard, you're encouraged to not focus on negative things, or read about, or write about, or talk about. Um, things of a negative nature that you don't want to come into your life. So, although I wrote about some negative things in my journal, I wasn't very explicit. Uh, One of the things they say that can speed up the law of attraction is if you write about something in great detail, you get into the detail, into the feeling of it, um, into the emotion of it, and it speeds up the manifestation process, so to speak. So I didn't get in real in-depth with certain things. So then, as it relates to negative things, in your journal, you believe that had you documented instances that Travis had been violent with you, that that would beget more violence? Is that what you're telling us? Yes, it would be. How would writing about Travis being violent with you in your journal violate this law of attraction that you were following? One of the things that the law of attraction encourages is when you're in a relationship with somebody to focus only on their good qualities and more of those good qualities will come forth in the relationship as opposed to the negative qualities. When you're harping on somebody's faults all the time, those seem bigger than the better the qualities that you're looking for. So that was just one of the reasons. The other was I didn't want Travis to read it read about that. And the third, of course, is I didn't want... She was asked about this law of attraction. Next question, sustained. Why would the... Why then would you not write, and maybe it's the same reason, anything about seeing Mr. Alexander masturbate to the image of a child? Why would you not write that in your journal? Well, there are a lot of reasons. The biggest reason is I couldn't imagine writing something like that, like, you know, okay, today I walked in on Travis beating off to pictures of kids. I couldn't write something like that in my journal because that's
I'll finish the sentence for you, love. Not true. Horrific to me, and I did have personal concern that if something like that were written in my journal, that that, that could be, come back to haunt me. Um, we don't know what was on these missing pages, as we said before, but I'll tell you something that wasn't on those missing pages. Travis doing anything like this. No, and also the fact that he... he he beat it wasn't in there. The fact that he did this, that and the other wasn't in there. Yeah. So, you know, she's trying to explain away about John Dixon and about how, um, you know, she may have written something about him beating her. But on the days in question, as we saw, Martinez went meticulously through her diary journals. Nothing in there. No, no beatings. Absolutely nothing. No, I think she removed the incriminating evidence. Yeah. I really don't know how at this time of the trial she was able to sleep at night with what she was doing. It just goes to show you just how truly evil and twisted and what a black soul this heartless piece of swamp donkey shite has. It's definitely not something that I wanted to record for history's sake. And again, being involved in the church at that time, we're encouraged to record things. Mormons are very big on record keeping. And I would have much preferred to have just erased that day from the record. And I never would have put something like that that would also jeopardize Travis's life or his... Fuck off. I, I don't know, his... Something illegal about him. I wouldn't want to put that in my journal. Something that could compromise his status. And would those same reasons you just stated be the reason why you didn't talk about any of the violent incidents in your journals? Yes, again, he would read them. To tell us about I asked, on yes or no. I asked her the reasons, not a yes or no question. I asked her the reasons why she didn't put these in. Question. What? These violent, we talked about many half dozen or so violent incidents with Mr. Alexander throughout the course of your testimony. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. On cross-examination, it was pointed out that there was no record of this anywhere in your journals. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. My question to you, and we've talked about this as it relates to a few incidents, but as it relates to all these incidents, why wouldn't you put something of that nature in your journals? What are the reasons? Well, one, I didn't want to solidify it. I mean, this sounds like denial, but I didn't want to solidify it more in reality by putting it on paper and making it more concrete. So that's bullshit excuse number one. And another reason is that, and that goes to law of attraction, another reason is that I, if Travis were to read it, in the past he made me tear out some negative things I'd written about him. So I didn't want to put more things on paper that were negative about him. I just wanted to focus on his good qualities, not his shortcomings. Okay. And that's bullshit excuse number two. Yeah, and I don't know about this stuff with the Mormon church and journals. I don't know if that's true, but... Travis, from what you know, we've gathered about him, it kind of strikes me that he would respect Jodie's privacy when it comes to a journal. Yeah, he wouldn't just read it without her permission anyway. Once again, projecting, she doesn't give a crap about anybody's privacy, so she's trying to project that behaviour onto Travis, and somehow I don't buy that, do you? No, I think it's sick what she's doing. It's absolutely sick. Now I want to ask you about some specific entries you were uh, questioned about, referring you to uh, Exhibit 455. You were shown this entry. Do you recall that? Yes. I'm not quoting the whole thing, uh, but you say you love Travis Alexander so completely. 
correct? Yes. And you felt that at the time? Yes. Okay. As it relates to your journal that day, was that your entire entry? No. I'm going to show you what's just been marked as exhibit number 510, if I may approach on. Yes. And Ms. Arias, if you could just take a look at this and advise us if this constitutes your entire entry of 82607. Yes. These are three entries instead of the one that was presented to her by the state dated Sunday, August 26, 2007. So I would object. Plus, it also has writings apparently put there by defense counsel. Counsel, please approach. Turning your attention back to Exhibit 510, there are. See, this is where I wish we'd have used something uh, with the sidebars because we could have found out whether she. Um, overruled or sustained the objection or not. Um, I'm guessing that being as Nermi's still talking about Exhibit 510, that the only 510. She admitted, she admitted it. it, or maybe, as you said off mic, she maybe admit, admitted part of it. You know? Yeah, she could have, but we don't know because we, <laughs> we didn't hear either a sustain or an uh, or yeah an overrule. Overrule. Um, we may find out later on, but if we don't, um, somebody let us know whether that went through or not. I'm guessing it did. Separate. It appears to write down the date on a couple of different occasions in this exhibit. Could you take a look at that for us when you put the date in three, three different areas? Turning your attention back to Exhibit 510, there are separate, appears to write down the date on a couple of different occasions in this exhibit. Could you take a look at that for us when you put the date in three? Three different areas? Yes. And in terms of that date, all those are dated August 27th of 2007. Is that correct? 26th. 26th, excuse me. Was that then a continuation of the thoughts and ideas you were having on that day? Checks for me. Overruled in the answer. Yes, it was all the same day. We move to admit Exhibit 510, Judge. Judge May, I board iron the witness. I have objection on the grounds of foundation. You may. Ma'am, with regard to that particular exhibit, there are three separate entries, aren't there? Yes. And they're both on August 26 of 07, right? All three of them, yes. And in fact, on the first page, there's some highlight, right? Yes. You didn't highlight it, did you? No. You didn't put that on there, right? No. And in fact, on the second page, there's some words, right? Yes. You didn't write those words on there, did you? No. And then on the other entry, which is involving August 26 of 07, it also has some more highlights on it, right? Yes. You didn't put those on there, right? No. And in fact, there's some words on there. You don't put, didn't put those on there either, did you? No. And the same thing with regard to the last page of this particular exhibit. It doesn't, it has some writing on it, doesn't it? Oh, yes. It highlights it, doesn't it? Yes. You didn't put that on there, did you? No. Additionally, it includes um, August 28 of 07, Tuesday, doesn't it? Yes. That has nothing to do with August 26 of 07, right? No. 
And in fact, with regard to Sunday, August 26 of 07, you do write what we previously talked about involving your undying love for Mr. Alexander, correct? Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope of the board I or the witness that I would object to anyway. Overruled. You may continue. And then in another part of this particular uh, entry, you talk about a wholly different person, don't you? Person? Yes. I believe I did mention that. Yes, you do, don't you? It's not about Travis Alexander, the rest of it, is it? Well, the rest of it? No, the rest of this entry has nothing to do with Travis Alexander, does it? It doesn't have to be, Your Honor. The it's not related to the foundation. Objection. Continue. Does it? The highlighted portion does. I'm not asking about the highlighted portion. I'm asking about the one on the right that's not highlighted. That has nothing to do with Mr. Alexander, does it? No, that's law of attraction stuff. Right. It doesn't have to do with Mr. Alexander and what happened with regard to August 26 of 07, does it? Indirectly it does because it's law of attraction, it but it doesn't mention about, Doesn't it talk about your mental outlook and what you need to do at self-improvement, man? Yes. And then the same thing with regard to the second page of the first August 26 of 07 entry, right? Isn't that what it talks about? Objection. I'm going to ask for approach. You may. Wow. This is heating up. Yeah, that was rather... I mean, he just covered in, what, two or three minutes what Nermi would take about three quarters of an hour to cover. Yeah, he? considering he kept going backwards and backwards and backwards. Forwards and backwards and forwards, yeah. Um, I think that he's trying to say that this is inadmissible because, you know, he, her legal team have scrolled all over it, put highlights on it. Um, and also she's trying to misrepresent it, so he's quite right to object to this, and you can see why he's strenuously trying to pursue this. Yeah. Yeah, let's see how this, this ends up. Oh yeah, I can't wait. Mr. Harris, could you do me a favor and uh, read through the entirety of the exhibit? 510. Okay. Based on your review of that document dated uh, August 26, 2007, without telling us exactly what was written in there. So I'm guessing it wasn't admitted? Looks like it. What issues are you dealing with in your life on August 27, 2007? 26, right? Huh? 26. 26, I'm sorry. Um, I am writing about Travis. Um, the range of emotions that I feel when I'm with him. Obsession. Okay. And was that subject matter, the range of emotions that you feel with him, was that something that was on your mind all throughout that day? Predominantly, yes. Okay. And the journal entries that you made throughout that day predominantly deal with those issues. Is that accurate? Objection, me answer. Um, Yes, I would say so. It starts with him and ends with him. Okay. I want to draw your attention now to the uh, highlighted portions um, of those journal entries. Can you look at those and tell us what the significance is of the highlighted portion? In this first highlighted portion, I'm writing about the range from positive to negative that I feel when I'm with him. And the next highlighted portion? Um, I'm writing about suicide. Is that directly related to the positive and negative things you're feeling related to Mr. Alexander? I would say it was a trigger, but not the cause. Okay. 
and the next highlighted portion. If she was writing about suicide, I'm guessing it was because it finally dawned on her that Travis didn't want her. Yeah, and she couldn't deal with that. Yeah. Because she was too obsessed and possessive of him. Yeah, that's just speculation once again. Yeah, we don't know. We're just talking. I write about being at Rachel's house and about not wanting Travis to know because he would be upset and about not tolerating any longer him saying negative things about her or any of my friends. What bloody friends. And vice versa about anyone saying, not tolerating anything when anyone saying anything negative about Travis either. And was that the last highlighted portion there on the document? Yes. And all those dealt with Mr. Alexander and the issues you were dealing with in your own mind on that day. Is that accurate? Yes, either directly or indirectly. Judge, and once again, we're going to move to Exhibit 510. Okay, it's actually a lack of foundation relevance. Additionally, there's some writings that are not attributed to the defendant that somebody put in there, but we don't know who. More foundation regarding the words that are written in orange. Draw your attention again, Ms. Arias, to Exhibit 510, as well as 242001. You see the words written on that Exhibit 510 in orange? Yes. Looking at Exhibit 242001, what do those uh, words, and you can flip to the other pages of either exhibit, what do those words signify? They signify the fact that this page has been torn out, part of it. And those pages are, are actually torn out in your journal, is that correct? That's correct. Judge, I'm going to move to admit exhibit 510. Lack of foundation as to who tore it out. Thanks. We just had testimony about that, Judge. <coughs> Tied up to that particular entry. The, as it relates to August 26, 2007, these pages that were torn out. Um, and you previously testified that you tore out those pages? Yes, I did. Those half pages, excuse me. Now we move to the next exhibit. Subject to the same foundation, I don't have anything else to add to it. All right. Five ten. So Nermi won the battle, but <laughs> there's no way he's going to win the war, is there? No, and the war's going to start soon. Yeah. Okay, ready. Now, by comparison, this is Exhibit 455, and we talked about that not being your entire entry at that occasion or on that day, correct? That's correct. Okay. The rest of your entry... that day is approximately using the journal pages as a guide. Almost six pages, is that correct? It's actually leaning and this characterizes that entry. Those are three entries. Oh, oh right. <coughs> yes. Okay. What I'd like you to do, um, we can see the part here uh, before that's contained in exhibit 455 we can see that written above the highlight highlighted portion 
maybe if you could begin uh, reading 455 and moving into the highlighted portion that's contained in Exhibit 510. Could you just read that for us? Yes, start from the beginning? Yes. Well, it's a good thing that nobody else reads this because I write right now that I love Travis Victor Alexander so completely that I don't know any other way to be. I wish I did because at times my heart is sick and saddened over all that has come to pass. I don't understand it and at times I still have a hard time believing it. He makes me sick and he makes me happy. He makes me sad and miserable and he makes me feel uplifted and beautiful. All in all, I shouldn't be wording it as if he makes me feel those things. Move it up for you, sorry. It all originates from within. All of my darkness is a result of my own creation. It is the fruit of my thoughts planted continually and with too much repetition. Well, the first part of that happy bollocks was a textbook example of um, narcissism and <laughs> obsession, wasn't it? Yeah, and the second part was just her wallowing in self-pity. Yeah, just a complete self-pity trip. Pathetic. Do you want me to keep reading? Well, no, let's stop there. When you say all of your darkness is a result of my own creation, what are you, what are you telling us there about uh, the relationship with Travis? What you say above? I'm just reading she says all of my darkness is a result. doesn't say anything about Mr. Alexander. Okay. When you talk, you, you, previous sentence you're talking about Mr. Alexander. Uh, you say, all in all, I shouldn't be wording it. He makes me feel those things. Right? You see that? Right. Okay. You say it all originates from within. Meaning, well, what does that mean? It all originates from within. To me, that, that just means that I'm responsible for how I feel, and Travis is not. Although I feel certain ways around him, I didn't want... I'm trying to take responsibility for my own feelings, not that he is making me feel that way, but that the darkness that I feel is because of myself, not because of him. Well, at least she acknowledges she's got a dark side. Yeah, she acknowledges it, but the thing is, is she just writing that for the sake of it? What do you mean? Like, playing on sympathy, what, maybe. In, in case someone reads it? Yes. In case Travis reads it? Yeah, because Travis, she, as she admitted, she's still in love with him. Do you know something? It wouldn't surprise me if she actually gave her journal to Travis to read, rather than him sneaking peeks or demanding to look at it or whatever he wouldn't have snuck peeks in order for him to read it she would have had to have given it him exactly yeah so this just this story just stinks doesn't it it does don't make sense Drawing your attention to second entry on August 26, 2007. Could you read that for us? I just wish I could die. You're not the only one, love, but okay. You're not the only one. I wish that suicide was a way out, but it is no escape. I wouldn't feel any more pain though if I could just stop existing and have my consciousness dissolved into nothingness and my energy recycled into something else useful, for I am of little use to the world right now through no fault but my own. I won't argue. Judge Price. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning, 10.15, let's say 10.30 tomorrow morning, 10.30, please remember the admonition, you are excused, have a nice evening.
record will show the jury has left the courtroom. It's serious. You may step down. Counsel, anything else for today? Thank you. So it appears we entered a DeLorean and went back in time a few days on that one. Yeah, like he always does. I mean, we knew there would be a redirect, and it appears that the redirect hasn't finished, but it almost exclusively centred on the sex tape, didn't it? Yeah, and I don't understand why, because it's irrelevant. I think what Nermi is trying to do is point out you know the the extreme sexual relationship that they had not just physical but over the phone as well but i think he's belabored the point he's whatever point he had to prove he proved it long ago and now he's just hammering it in, hammering it into the ground isn't he yeah and it gets old pretty quickly very quickly yeah so um well we've got juan martinez he's you know recross examination if you like his redirect to look forward to um or his rebuttal if you like yeah that's a silver lining i guess yeah and it was good to see him you know take center stage for albeit a very brief time in this one yeah but he got the point across <laughs> he did yeah so um so that's part 30 we god we're 30 parts into this i can't believe it i know yeah, thank you all for watching. Uh, much appreciated. Please keep the comments coming. Once again, if we've got anything wrong in this or if we've misspoken or if we've stated something as a fact when it's not a fact, please do let us know. We'll be quite happy to hold up our hands. And Yeah, we always hold up our hands when we're wrong. Yeah. Um, it's either in the video or in the comments we will acknowledge, you know, kind of our mistake. Um, but seriously thank you all so much for watching um please do drop a like on this video if you're not subscribed to us yet please do we've got kind of a variation on the jody series coming out haven't we soon yeah i hope uh, everyone gets to see that yeah marshmallow madness that's coming <laughs> um it's basically uh, the trial and our commentary but chopped up into one hour segments that's basically for people who can't handle sitting there for four or five hours yeah like some of our videos are yeah so we're just going to chop them up and just put them into bite-sized chunks for you so those of you who like are on a schedule you can like on a lunch hour or something you want to listen to one it's there for you right well we'll see you very soon for part 31 yeah thank you very much everybody yep please take care please do look after yourselves and as we always say one, one love, love from, from macclesfield, macclesfield. bye bye